Welcome back to the Fast Life Podcast, which is brought to you by Simpson Motorcycle Helmets. Introducing the latest helmet from Simpson, the Carbon 3.0 Outlaw Bandit. I've had the pleasure of using this helmet for a few months now, and I must say it's truly impressive. The classic Outlaw style combined with a few new features like the new visor detents, which allows you to ride with the visor up at high speeds. You can check out this helmet and all other available models and finishes at SimpsonMotorcycleHelmets.com and then give them a follow on the gram at Simpson Motorcycle Helmets. In today's episode, I'm with Dave, who was formerly a co-host on the Four for the Road podcast. Dave is a history buff and has really dedicated time to the history of motorcycle culture and clubs. He is a veteran and a motorcycle traveler and an all-around good dude. So let's hear from our sponsors, and then we'll get right into this episode with Dave. Over the past year, Cowboy Harley-Davidson has been putting in the work to help bring together various aspects of the motorcycle culture within the Austin, Texas community. They have supported not only the podcast, but also many local bike events and shows, including our FXR tour. I want to express my gratitude to the entire staff at Cowboy Harley for their support. I've had the pleasure of purchasing two bikes from Cowboy Harley-Davidson in my lifetime. Most recently, I bought a Lowrider ST, which was dialed in with a few custom parts that I pretty much got to have on every bike. Whether you are in the market for a new or used Harley-Davidson or looking to get your motorcycle customized, repaired, or simply maintained, you can count on their professional parts and service departments to get your bike dialed. To get in touch with them, you can visit their website, CowboyHarleyAustin.com, or simply drop in and start a conversation about your next or even your first Harley Davidson. And don't forget to give them a follow on the gram to stay up to date with all the other happenings and events going around in the Austin, Texas area. I have been using Lexan Moto products for the past six years and they have been an integral part of my riding experience. My journey with them started with their original FT4 headset and tire pump, but now I've upgraded to their top of the line Novus headset, which features 40 millimeter Lexan Plus speakers, CVC and DSP noise cancellation technology. With the Mesh 3.0 power technology behind it, I can connect with up to 32 riders on any given ride. Their new P5 Advanced Smart Tire Pump is a must have for every biker. I always keep one in my garage and it comes in handy during long trips if my phone battery or tire pressure is low. For more information on these fantastic products, check out their website, lexan-moto.com, and don't forget to use the offer code FASTLIFE at checkout to save you 15% on your order. And lastly, head on over to Instagram and give these guys a follow at lexanmoto. Hey guys, you ready to let the dogs out? Fast Life Podcast where do we even start, man? I think we finished it all at dinner. Yeah, I think we and just the ride around. wrapped it up as I got the tour of Madison, Wisconsin. Had you ever been? I mean, I know you've been to Madison before. I've never been in downtown proper. Yeah. So, I mean, it's not that big. I mean, it's not Dallas or Houston, but it's cool. How many, how like, like vast is like the suburbs grow? Like, is there like a lot of suburbs? So like you go 20 miles in any yeah, direction? Yeah, I feel like... As soon as you get overpopulated with minorities, then you have to. It's not real. <laughs> this is actual. The we're not saying you keep that, that in. Yeah, you keep that. No. Um. Yeah, I think that Madison, like, because it's so small and there's like it's divided by like two lakes, like literally yeah. like two lakes, two lakes on each side of it. So people just had to find somewhere else to yeah. go. So there's a ton of like suburbs, like Dane County itself. I mean, there's so many other like little towns and cities like yeah. just outside of Madison. Literally, like, like here we're in Middleton. I live in Middleton. Did you notice a difference? Like, it's not like one ends and all of a sudden you're another one. They literally just all touch each other. So Yeah. It's well, like, if it's I guess it's probably like what it sounds like Dallas, Fort Worth is like, except I'm a hundredth of a scale, like that much. Yeah, so well, we're all flat. We don't really, all the lakes and they're around us are all man-made. So, you know what I mean? It's like, there's nothing separating everything. You can just sprawl in every direction as far as the eye can see. And um, it's just, uh, I like it though. I, I kind of want to live in a town where it's like five miles, you know, from the center to the end of it, suburbs and all. And then it's kind of like nothing for like 30 miles into the next town, you know? I'm telling you, I know nobody shares my thought process on it, but I love Wall, South Dakota. Now, I don't want to live in Wall. Wall drug or Wall? Wall. I don't want to live in Wall, 
with all these fucking tourists, right? But have you ever driven like the side roads that go out? Don't get back on the interstate, but mm-hmm. like the side highways and shit. No, it's there's nothing. So you could come into Wall, get your groceries, get your tourist girls, get to the bar, or whatever, do all that shit, and then just back out. And nothing. I don't know if I've ever been to Wall. Like it's you ever just been to Wall Drug? A lot of times you've been to Stages. Oh Wall Drug. Yeah, I've it's the same thing. It. It's the same okay. town. But yeah, yeah, all you have is that like little Main Street shit. But as soon as you start taking these side roads, uh-huh. like there's just nothing. I love that. That's my jam. I think my favorite town I've ever gone through is Montrose, Colorado. Yeah? Yeah, it's like, it's not that vibe. It's uh, it's on the Million Dollar Highway, but it's south of Grand Junction and north of, like, Ure. So, but, like, what happens in the winter? Do, like, people flock to it in the winter uh, for skiing and stuff? I think from what I've understood about it, and they're, all my friends that live there are probably like, shut the fuck up. Shut the fuck up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Stop it's telling a, people. They don't get as harsh winters as, we, as I would think Colorado. So it's not, like, as appealing to skiers and, and shit like that yeah i mean i think they got to come through there to get to certain spots but i mean tell you riding all that stuff is yeah. you don't go through there to get there i don't believe mm. in certain ways i guess if you're coming from denver you would but yeah. i don't know not that smart about it i just know that the group of us found it one day on a, on a bike trip and we it's like what do you do when you go to a cool place you start the one of the first things is you if you like the vibe the environment you start thinking okay how far is it to these places that you like to go in your life? Yeah. Like, how far is it to L.A.? How far is it to Sturgis? How far is it back where I'm from? And you're like, oh, shit. Like, it's literally like a 1,000 miles from everywhere or less than a 1,000 miles from everywhere. It's like 600 to L.A., like six, seven-ish to Sturgis. It was 800 miles back to Dallas. And I'm like, God damn. Like, I, these, I'm a day drive everywhere, yeah. you know? Well, now, you're older than I am, I think, right? By a couple of years. So mm-hmm. I just turned 39. Mm-hmm. And I find myself, like, morbidly thinking about that forever place. Like, where the fuck am I going to die? And I don't know that. It's, I don't know. It obviously depends on like, what your kids do and shit like that. You probably yeah. want to be close to family and maybe we'll stay here. But it's like, okay, could I die in anywhere in Illinois? Like, fuck no. <laughs> like, it's terrible. I don't want to retire there. I don't want to live there. But, like, you start traveling to these places and you're like, dude, where would I want to... Where would I want to live? Yeah. And, like, for me, like, obviously, like, Montana and Wyoming and all those places, they get all the they get all the Kevin Costner cred. They get all the scenery. <laughs> right? I get it. I get it. It's gorgeous fucking places. But I don't ski. Like, yeah. I don't need to be in the mountains. I just want to be, like, accessible yeah. to them. So, like, you take a place, again, uh, I don't know, actually, if I'd live in Wall <laughs> Off drug, yeah. Well, you take towns like that where there's literally nothing going on, and nobody. And if you have the means, like retire in retirement age or whatever, to like live there, I think that shit sounds yeah so cool. Like just somewhere where people don't want to go. Like I you said, like why we like Nebraska. Like people hate on Nebraska, yeah. Iowa. Those are some of my favorite rides. I love. I've only been to Iowa. I'm about to go to Iowa again on this trip, but I've really only been to Iowa like maybe once. I guess twice officially now. I love I like that fucking place. Yeah. You know, I like that. I like Kansas City. I like Missouri. I like Arkansas, even though there's a little there's like a, a gene missing there in some of the minds <laughs> of some of the people, but uh no, I'm fucking with them. It's uh I like a lot of this mid I like Midwest. Yeah. I think I'm I think I like living. I like the 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 home base of a Midwest town. Yeah. But the ability to, uh, you know, living cheap enough to always travel. You know what I mean? Because mm-hmm. that's kind of the thing. It's like you go to California and you spend a lot more money to be in the place yeah. all the time. But you're constantly trying to keep up with, like, the rising, you know, cost of everything that you can't really leave. Well, and, and you have family in California, so you've obviously spent way more time there uh, than I have. But my understanding of it is, is I think kind of what you talk about Texas, too, is, Depending on where you are in California, it may take you a long ass time to, to ride out of there, yeah. drive out of there, or whatever. I mean, when you start talking about, you know, you mentioned earlier, like a, a Missouri or something like that, a Kansas City, you're you're easy in and out. Like if you want to go to Texas, if you want to go yeah. East Coast, if you want to go West Coast, it's like a good central hub. Um, that's what I like about here. Yeah. If I want to go West, I could be in Sturgis in ten hours. Yeah. Uh, I can be in the East Coast and. <laughs> 14 a day's ride i can be uh from here from my door to your door is 12 hours mm. so i mean you gotta get central okay illinois is the worst part of it <laughs> yeah illinois is a is a rough one now, i don't know man like I, I think that like you know being that's why it's hard to move from texas because we're central too like it would be nicer to be a little bit further north because you know 
but it's like north of us, you got Oklahoma City, you got Wichita, Kansas, and then there's kind of nothing, really, yeah. and like directly north. I like Oklahoma City. I could see myself living there, but we get tornadoes in Texas, obviously. Yeah. Especially in Dallas, we get them. Um, but they're very far and few between, right? In is Oklahoma, it like some kind of like, like, why is it like Oklahoma is considered like Tornado Alley, but then they don't come into Texas? Well, it, Texas is part of Tornado Alley too. Okay. Like it dips into where we're at, and especially West Texas and stuff. But, um, man, I had did a, I did a whole deep dive research on that one day, and actually had talking points, but drank way too much beer since then. Um, but basically, were you gonna were you gonna podcast about tornadoes? No, it's just like, <laughs> look, when you become a biker or you uh, try to be a biker, I, I thought it was in your blood. I thought you were born in this. No, well, you you there's a couple things in life that become a little bit more important: weather, yeah, maps, yeah, and you know, like, uh, you know, like, I guess those are two main things. That, like, those are two main things you're always checking whenever you're going somewhere. Yeah. You're looking at maps to figure out the route, where you want to go, what you want to see. And you're always checking the weather to see what kind of shit's going on. And you're always also looking at the weather, like, all over the year. Like, what's the rainy season on the coast of, of Oregon? Mm -hmm. You know, what times of year? There's a rainy season for L.A. and California, right? People think it never rains there, but, like, I think they call it, uh, it's like June gloom. I think June is a... I don't know. I forget the fucking like analogy that they use for yeah. it, but but yeah, you have to pay attention to the weather. I mean, yeah, what was it by you? Was it this summer? Did you guys have like all those consecutive days like above one hundred and five or something yeah. like that? Yeah, it was rough. Like you're just gonna like oh, I'm gonna ride, <laughs> I'm gonna ride to Texas this week and ride around during the day. Yeah, no, it's horrible. But you know, that's kind of like why I like to travel in the summer. You know, I like to road trip in the winter, in the dead of winter, mm -hmm. travel in the summer, and then use the in-betweens the fall and the spring to to work like actually do paint work because yeah. the weather's perfect it's cheaper to keep the shop heated or cooled um and then you're literally just you know like good weather like you said and then you go to the summer when it's fucking 105 degrees and you're paying so much money on an ac bill to keep a shop cool enough yeah. to paint in or vice versa in the winter where i have a, a full heating and ac unit but because the shop's not fully insulated like you would want it, mm -hmm. and I have a paint booth, so as soon as you turn the paint booth on, it sucks all the air out of the shop, cold or hot. It yeah. doesn't discriminate. <laughs> and so in the summer when it's 105 degrees, that AC's running nonstop, and then you turn the booth on, and then it all goes out the, out the window. Same thing in the winter. And then in the winter, because it's harder to heat it is, and it is, I would say it's harder to heat or cool, but it's definitely... There's not some other thing I can buy to help cool it as well. On the heat side of it, I have a diesel heater. So I can, every other day, go fill it up with diesel. And then that'll help kind of regulate the heat as mm -hmm. I turn the booth on. You know, so it's just expensive, man. Like, So is that stuff that you calculate if you're ever going to leave Texas? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. It's like, I, but, you know, when you get up north, like, um, the 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 cooling isn't as important as the heating mm -hmm. right and then furnaces are big uh, out up north um you know wood burning stoves kind of thing like oh, there's just all these other ways to heat shit <laughs> do you say wood burning stoves it is how it it's is. not the 1800s it's like oh. we have hvac here do all have, we're not uh, just out shopping have wood. Have the internet do y'all have that <laughs> <laughs> oh man <laughs> I met last night at Mama Tried. I met a dude that was from Australia mm -hmm. in in Fuel Cafe, and so we're having beers. And I yeah. was like, I was like, man, does the uh, does the toilet really flush in reverse or whatever backwards? He's like, yeah, it does. And then he's like, started telling me that like tornadoes cycle backwards, and I was like, shut the fuck up, no, they don't. But I don't know. I, I was pretty drunk, but I'm pretty sure that he showed me something on his phone with Google that said that tornadoes go backwards. I might have to look that up. But they, they, the cyclone twists in the opposite direction of how they do here. I don't even know what direction. Is it counterclockwise? I don't know what it is now either. I thought he was just fucking with me. But well, was there was good. that. I watched, uh, if you watched The Long Way Down, mm -hmm. when they did when they did that whole series uh, going to the south of, uh, the tip of South Africa, um, that was the whole bit uh, at the equator that they have all these people that are showing that the water does this other thing. Yeah. But it was they. I think they proved it to be a hoax. I I think it was. I think it was just fucking with me. Yeah, it yeah. was good either way. Yeah. I was like, dude, let me just buy you another drink. You just keep telling me stories. Yeah. I was like, what was Steve Irwin like? 
Having a brand like Arlen S support the Fast Life podcast is absolutely surreal. Decades before I fell in love with motorcycles, the Ness brand was right there innovating and inspiring generation after generation. The brand's long-standing history and dedication to the custom motorcycle industry is truly remarkable. I have been fortunate enough to use many of their products on my Road Glide, Lowrider ST, and FXR Chopper over these past few years. I love their four and six piston brake calipers, wheels, and bagger mid controls, and I use Arlen S air cleaners on all my bikes. And even after thousands of miles, the parts still look and feel new. If you're interested in learning more about the Arlen S motorcycle products, head on over to arlenss.com where you can find out more information and see their vast catalog. And for our listeners, if you drop the Fast Life 10 offer code at checkout, you're going to save yourself 10% on your order. And don't forget to give these guys a follow on Instagram at Arlen S Motorcycles to stay up to date with all the happenings around the brand. Now let's get back to the show. All I care about no, you. No, you got to ask him the, the fuck kill Mary. Or the, oh, yeah. <laughs> I asked him, I was like, are you a Keith Urban fan? Uh, like, you know, yeah. Crocodile Dundee. Oh, that's a good uh, Steve Irwin or what's, I mean, there's a lot of good actors that came out of out of uh, Australia. Oh, I did ask him if he would fuck Eric Bana. I did ask that. Cause, like, I'd fuck Eric Bana. Like Black Hawk Down, Eric Bana, <laughs> it's fuckable. Um, and I really think that talking about which celebrities you would fuck are the only thing that's going to put me above uh, Craig Tarpon Turbo's ratings. And that's my only goal ever. Whenever we do one of these, yeah. is I look like, what did Craig do? And then can I just get like one view past that? Craig's actually, he's becoming a very seasoned podcast guest. Yeah. That, that one we did on Patreon, it was, I forgot how funny he can be sometimes. Yeah, yeah, we blocked that out. Yeah, it's like, oh, whatever, dude. <laughs> but no, he's, he's, it was a good podcast, but I, I don't know. I feel I feel bad that it, I wouldn't even say I feel bad. I understand that like a lot of people want to be on the the main podcast, like they want to be on that one. Yeah. But the Patreon stuff is like I, I want to put good content on there. And Craig, no matter what the topic is, no matter what it is, Craig going is on, a funny dude. I me and Craig can sit down and have a good conversation. You know, what I love the most about Craig mm. is that you can get him good. You can give him shit, mm-hmm. and he takes shit almost better than anybody else. Yeah. Like there's some people where they'll take a little bit of shit. But then they're gonna like start getting annoyed. Yeah. But Craig can give it and take it, and yeah. I think that's a rare quality. Well, at my camp out last year, I was on stage on hour eight of being on stage with a microphone. It was like the deep cuts of the podcast when you got a mountain of beer, and I'm just talking <laughs> the most shit to Craig. I yeah. have a microphone, and he's just standing out there looking at me like. <laughs> and I I actually apologized to him. I was like, hey, man, sorry about that. <laughs> I thought on that on that Patreon one he did though he was like kind of ta- yeah tap dancing around. Um, all that pedophile drama on the internet. And I was like, yeah. that's really weird because he looks like a pedophile. He does. Um, <laughs> the John Wayne Gacy situation. I, yeah, he does look like John Wayne Gacy. Is like so spot on on his, like that was the funniest shit. <laughs> There's a lot of like gems that have come out of the Down South Camp Out over the years. The first year was when we started saying that my machine is dies his beard. Because <laughs> it was so dark. So, yeah. And yeah. then pff, the next year was the John Wayne Gacy thing. And the burnout <laughs> seen around the world. <laughs> yeah. Um, I think um, Mercenaries video ended up being on uh, Ridiculousness. Did it really? Yeah, I think so. I wonder if they know that. They probably know that. I think they do. Uh, so basically, they had an angle and I had an angle. Yeah. And both of them end up getting like millions of views yeah. on it and shit. But that was wild. Like, uh, yeah, We have a group chat and every once in a while like somebody will post how somebody's still commenting on that on that reel about what assholes people are. Yeah, and then literally I was on the – well, I did a podcast with Warren from Mama Tried. I talked about that burnout and the fact that we did that burnout situation. You know, Sit Down Steve did it. We all filmed it. We're all there. We all witnessed it. And then literally a month and a half later, we were at the Mama Tried, the makeup year, in Fuel Cafe doing a burnout on a fucking bar. Did and you did you go into Fuel Cafe this year? Yeah, yeah. All the fucking tread that's on the uh, the ceiling above the bar, <laughs> it's crazy. Like the whole ceiling is sprayed with with tread. Wow. If you look above, like where the rut marks are. Yeah. Because they must have done. Like, I mean, I'm sure they probably did another one this year. I didn't yeah. see it yet on, on Instagram, but apparently yeah, it's, it's all calculated. Fresh. Yeah, they. Do well, it they figured. Like, I mean, good for them to lean into it. Yeah, hundred like, percent. It blows up every time they do it and goes viral. So why not get your fucking brand out there you're called fuel cafe yeah why not lean into it those those guys they put on a you, you got the scale right you have the flat out friday you have mama tried i mean just to even like 
attempt that in the smallest scale would yeah. cost thousands of dollars. I mean, that's got to be close to a million dollars worth of like things that have to happen for that thing to work that way. I think they've done a good job of blending different scenes. Yeah. Like I, I think that, and, and it's funny though, like when the shows break up, like the after hours, <coughs> like there's different bars that like, like it's almost like they pick, they cater to different crowds. Yeah. Like most of the chopper dudes are going to go to uh, Bad Moon. Yeah. Most of the, the performance bagger dudes are going to go to fucking Elwoods. Elwoods, yeah. Most of the old dudes that like don't want to hear anything are going to go to Fuel Like I Do. Because <laughs> yeah. they don't really, they don't get very crowded for the after party. So, yeah. but it's like, like depending on what scene you're in, like everybody gravitates towards like those bars. Yeah, I think that that's fair. I mean, that's the point of a lot of people are coming here to be in their crowds, you know, but like like I said, you know, I've been saying this a lot this year. I'm coming I want to be I want to come and experience new things. Mm-hmm. I want to be around crowds that I don't understand, or, you know, <laughs> and whatnot. Not that I don't understand it. I I think I, I want to be I want to understand <laughs> dance around a word here. I understand choppers. I understand the scene, but I want to be around it more to just see what makes it tick. So basically understand it. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Um, well, and, and I might catch shit for this, but we're talking at dinner. Yeah. Whether you like the bagger scene, whether you like the chopper scene, whether you like the fucking lawyer on his bagger thing or whatever, like whatever your thing is. Yeah. I don't know if you could have an argument against the chopper dudes being some of the most artistic yeah. in, in, in motorcycle culture in general. Yeah. Whether that's building bikes, whether that's painting, and I don't mean painting bikes, I mean like painting like artwork, yeah. writing, photography, film. They're doing film. Hundred percent film. And and as a guy that's been doing podcasts like with Todd Bluebaugh and all these other people I've been meeting in these last couple of months, they're all like they're all part of the movies like culture, mm-hmm. like making movies behind the scenes, they're set builders of this, uh, they're writing things, they're they're like they're just on a different path where it's like the, and I'm. It's not a this is better or, or worse. Like mm-hmm. no, no. But it is. There's a lot of artists in that culture. Yeah, and so with performance baggers, like you have like the best bike ever made. Mm-hmm. You know, the best shit. Like it. You don't have to worry. You can. You know, if you have two weeks of vacation, you want to spend every one of those fucking days on the road enjoying it. Get a performance bagger, and don't go retarded on the motor. Keep it keep it simple, and you can go enjoy every day on that bike, mm-hmm. right? But there's something about like wanting to ride a bike that's harder, you know. There's for me at least, there's something about wanting to be on a bike that forces me to have more patience, to have more like put a good analogy is this: I want to I want to do trips where I'm taking more photos and doing more photography, mm-hmm. right? But when I'm fucking blasting at 90 miles an hour down the highway, I'm less likely to stop at that that thing I just saw, yeah. right? So you end up, like, having, like, a mile's worth of deciding whether or not to turn around or not, and you're going so fast that you just, like, fuck it, I'm at this momentum right yeah, now. Yeah, I'm going to get the next one. Yeah, the next and one. then, you know, like, I always kick myself in the ass for it because wanting to intentionally go out and capture things, like, you have to be in the mindset of capturing Instead of like, I'm so ready to get off this bike, I want to get to the next spot. Yeah. Right? If you get, like, what I'm noticing on the FXR is that if you get off the highway, stop trying to keep up with traffic, start taking some of those roads and allowing yourself to take two or three hours extra to get to the destination, mm-hmm. you see the shit that's the world's been passing by every day. Yeah. And you see these gems of places that, like, you want to photograph or you want to Tell, tell on a podcast, this little town you rode through in the middle of nowhere, mm-hmm. you know? But if you're staying on the interstate and all you want to do is take pictures mm-hmm. next to the signs of the states that you crossed, you're... Look, if that's that that's a phase. That was the first thing I did, and then I wanted more. Yeah. That's the gateway drug. And then you get to the <laughs> point where you want to... I think the only thing after choppers is next thing you do, you want to ride dirt across the country, like the Trans-American Trail or some shit like that. You know what I mean? Yeah. But for the most part, like, I want to fucking see the country. Well, it's like like Harley does a good job of leaning into the advertisement for the Pan America because 90% of the advertisement they're putting out is the Pan America on a, on a red dirt trail somewhere, you know, yeah. out, looks like it's in Death Valley, just cruising around. Like, that shit's appealing. That looks yeah. fun. Like, that's a good... They're not show, You could ride the Pan America all over town, right? You could take yeah. a bar hopping, but they're not showing you that. Yeah. They're showing you these landscapes with the Pan America, like, just out there in what looks you like the see. middle of nowhere. You're like, yeah. all right, dude, that looks fun. 
Exactly. But yeah, to your to the point of what we were making at, at, at dinner, like there's a lot more artists. I think it's because riding bikes for those reasons like slowing down seeing it absorbing uh, getting all in your feels of like what the air you know smells like feels like what the scenery looks like how you know you're connected to the machine because you do have to be more mindful of like making sure everything's staying properly running it allows you to just it's almost like the right amount of distraction to keep you uh, motivated it's like having a good soundtrack as you draw or write or yeah you know do whatever so i don't know there's something to that and that's something i noticed being at mama tried from all the other like when i go when you when people go to which this will they won't hear this before uh daytona but when you go to daytona and everywhere you go you won't see art anywhere Mm -hmm. nowhere you go to hardcore baggers show or hardcore show like i'm not talking shit but it's not going to be any artists there there's nobody there there'll be photographers running around taking pictures and people videoing and stuff but there's no Nobody's selling prints. Nobody's selling. Nobody's making books about this culture. Yeah. Like, just, there's none and of that. I think you made a great point about the distinction between art and photography for influence, photography for followers, photography for promotion of brand or whatever. That's not art. Yeah, we can. Somebody can argue it that that it's, it's not. Yeah. It, like I said, if you're taking it for prints, if you're taking it to express, if you're just taking it because you're at an event where you know people are going to follow you. Yeah. You're just an influencer. Like you're not. Yeah. That's not art. I, I at Mama Try here. One of the things I wanted to do was get here because I knew a lot of photographers were going to be here. Mm-hmm. Uh, Jeremiah Smith is one that I fucking have loved his stuff lately. He's just got a fucking flavor. I bought three prints from him. It ended up being like two hundred something bucks. But these are prints I'm gonna take home and frame and put somewhere in my house. Yeah. You know, and they're they're just they capture a vibe. You mm-hmm. know, sometimes it's like your bike sitting in the gas station parking lot and you're walking out with a pack of fucking powdered donuts and a Red Bull <laughs> and you're ready to get another couple hundred miles in before you have to hang it up for the night or mm-hmm. whatever. But the sun's going down. It's blue hour. You got this like silhouette thing. It's like these, I think we all see the art in motorcycling. It's just that some of us are wanting to capture it or it just captures us so much that we want to fucking, you know, yeah. make something of that. And I'm not saying like, you know, you're not an artist if you don't sell print. Yeah. No, but if you're only like, if you only got your into pictures because you want to get follows and, and all this shit, like you want the yeah. ego, you want fucking, you want to get your rocks off because people, people follow your page. Like that's not art. Every one of my favorite photographers, almost every one of my favorite artists in all these uh, spectrums are, they don't really have a lot of uh, followers because they're not taking pictures of the things that, it's probably going to get them the most, uh, not going to get them the most likes and views because it's, you know, that's always going to, that's a different like algorithm. Yeah. But the people that really are looking for that type of art or looking for that inspiration, it'll reach them. And so big conversation I've been having with a lot of people over this weekend, you know, people are like, when are you going to do shirts? We're going to do this. I was like, I don't want to do mass anything. I want everything that I ever do to be something that's for the small percentage of people who want or who are looking for this inspiration. Yeah. You know what I mean? Well, and something you said on a podcast, gosh, I think it was years ago that I liked, is you talked about doing photography and you did prints for the dudes that were on the rides with you. Yeah. So that they could have them. Yeah. Like, that's art. Like, that's that's cool. Like, that, yeah, like, that still can bring you something, but that's literally doing and creating something for somebody else. Yeah. Because you have a passion for it. Like, that's art. Mm-hmm. Like, there's nothing coming back to you, and that's art. Like, you're giving something. Yeah. But, yeah, like I said, uh, choppers, they just seem to kind of have that kind of vibe. And I, I and I think that our, like, the performance bike culture, I mean, there's a lot of great photographers. You know, Josh, mm-hmm. um, we were talking about him at, at dinner, and he does great work. I mean, he's he's even shot me before at, like, Terra Lingua that I, I like the images. Yeah. But I think that we're all just conditioned to, like, put them on the Internet and then – tag the person and then it just it's just this internet data that no you know nobody ever scrolls down yeah you know? and i'm gonna say there's nothing wrong with promoting yourself yeah but again like what are you giving back if you're only taking if you're only doing things for promotion like it's yeah. are you promoting yourself like it's just it's not genuine and it's not art yeah art's genuine and and again i like what you said like it, it can be anything yeah R- riding cross country like you do that can be an art yeah 
you don't have to necessarily gain anything from it, but just riding cross country can be an art form. Yeah. One of the things I've had to come to terms with is like when you make something that you're proud of artistically, like through, you know, writing, photography, painting, whatever you want to do, whatever is like is a passion project that you want to tackle. If you're convincing yourself to do it based on the fact that it could get you to the next level or it yeah. could do this, then you're basing the whole premise of this creation on some kind of monetary or level gain yeah. that rather than like the, the fact of really trying to fully express yourself through that form, the way that you envision doing it. Yeah. Right. And by doing it that way, like you, you're never going to put your whole like soul into it because there's this aspect of finances, right? Mm -hmm. I need to get, I need said thing for this effort, right? Mm -hmm. Making art is not about like the, uh, traditional way of like go you go to work you put eight hours in you get eight hours worth of money back yeah doing art is based on like i have this thing i don't know what it looks like yet it's fuzzy it's blurry it's weird but something's there and you start fucking focusing and you, as you just spend more time the whole idea comes into focus and then you create it yeah if at any time you think that's going to make you a million dollars or that's going to make you the next chopsky or michael lichter or fucking you know, said person that, you know, makes movies or whatever, mm -hmm. like then you start to, I don't think that like it, it loses its value at that point, you know? And trust me, I'm, I'm speaking out of like, uh, you know, like I, that's, I'm training myself not to look at things that I'm doing as like, it's gotta be monetarily. Well, good you, for me. Yeah. But you've been an artist for 25 years. I mean, it, obviously you obviously in childhood and shit like that, you probably had a passion for, drawing or painting or, or working with stuff or whatever yeah. but i mean making money in in an artistic way for 25 years yeah i mean even like i think on one of the podcast podcasts you start off talking about sanding or prepping cars for like your dad or something yeah. like you had to work together i mean that's an art form yeah yeah and then i mean i don't know how many people know most people should know by now but then you know you were working on bikes um for rick fairless yeah why did it take so long to get a podcast with rick fairless after working for him uh, the the painter that he uses, the guy that I learned from, yeah, um, he's an old school guy, yeah. and because we don't work together, we're not supposed to like each other. Okay, it's one of those things. I love the dude. Yeah, but yeah. I've asked him to be on the podcast a hundred times. He, there, it was close to where he was going to come on at once, but then he just kind of ghosted me afterwards. So <laughs> it's a weird thing. I don't open up old wounds. No, it's it's fine. It's it's nothing. We can go back talking shit about Craig. <laughs> Well, let's talk about you, man. Like, you've had a wild year last year. Hmm. You wrecking bikes and shit, dude? Yeah, I smoked that fucking deer. Yeah, you just went right through that motherfucker. That was scary. Right? I thought I was dead. For real? Yeah. What's it like? Like, how, Did did it happen so quick there was absolutely nothing you could do? So, so I had spent the night in, in Iowa. Mm -hmm. um, with my, so I don't think anybody that my wife work, works with would ever listen to this. but <laughs> So my wife was in, was in Des Moines for work. So when she works, obviously they put her up in a hotel and, and all this shit. And I was going to ride, because uh, I'm a big nerd, I was going to do part of the Lewis and Clark Trail through Nebraska. Yeah. So like they have markings, like roughly, roughly, um, where they think like campsites were um, that uh -huh. you can kind of follow as they went through Nebraska, then through Chamberlain, South Dakota, and then up into North Dakota and all that kind of stuff. So I was going to do some of that. Mm -hmm. So I stayed the night in the morning, got up, I don't know, probably 7, 8 o'clock in the morning when I left her hotel cruising on on bang and adderall and just having a good time yeah <laughs> dude i'm talking early mornings on an energy drink and an adderall i don't know if we can say this on that podcast is no, the best just... fucking riding that you will ever do it's so much fun like well that that first 45 minutes of that adderall when that, <laughs> when that, that happy dude, layer kicks in yeah it's like, oh, and dude. you're going through iowa the sun is out like nobody's on the roads because it's fucking iowa yeah. and and so i'm just cruising just having a good time i was probably singing Brooks and Dunn uh, in my helmet or something <laughs> like that. And and it's Iowa, so it's flat. And I was on the interstate. And I had a point picked out on my GPS where I was going to get off the interstate. Yeah. Because at this point, I fucking hate interstate travel. Yeah. Like, I love the back roads. Like, I want to see what I'm missing out with. Like, yeah, I suppose if you ride nothing but the interstate through Iowa, you probably hate it. Mm -hmm. But I had the spot picked out. I'm just jamming along. And I saw this deer come across the road. All right, cool. It's gone. Then he doubled back and came back across the road. And I said, oh, all right, stupid. And that's how like long you can see him. <laughs> he came back a third time, 
And so I switched, I switched lanes. Like, all right, I'm gonna avoid this fucker. And he doubled back. And I just, I caught him. Like when he doubled back and it's like we made eye contact. I don't know if we actually did, but in the moment I felt like I'm looking at him and he's looking at me and we're both like, oh fuck. And I got so lucky because I, when I hit him, I hit him straight. You know, cause I think some people you panic yeah. and it's almost like you think you're in a car and maybe you want to turn. But you can't do that in a bike. Yeah. Especially at interstate speeds. If you panic turn, like you're going down. Yeah. And I didn't, I just, I think I just pause and, and held it straight like i don't think it was like, any conscious decision by holding it straight i hit him head on and just plowed right through him yeah i split him almost in two and so he kind of pushed away from my bike rather than underneath and you know as long as your rear tire is stable you can probably come out of, of most things it's yeah. when your rear tire gets loose that you're probably fucked yeah so i hit him head on it bent my handlebars it bent the front end but again my tire stayed straight he spun away from each side of the bike and i just coasted over to the side Wow. Like covered in deer shit. <laughs> Dude, that's weird. Like, I'm just thinking of it in slow motion. Yeah, like, oh, was, I remember, like, I, and the worst thing that happened was. What like, hurt though? Something had to have hurt, right? Like, like, did you feel like your hands going through or any of that? No, I, I came up out of my seat, but I held the handlebars and I came back down on top of them. And I like kind of like jammed my shoulder into them. And that was it. I had a, a bruise on my shoulder yeah. and that was it. Wow. Everything was, was was fine that's crazy and this old couple i remember this old couple was in the opposite lane only car on the road and they they came through the emergency like cop turn off and like turned around and came over and like oh my god we are you okay i was like yeah i think so like we just want to pray for you and i was like okay <laughs> so they like they prayed on the side of the road yeah and like this old grandma i mean i'm in their 70s she's like holding my hand and they're praying and i was like i don't Okay, I'm, yeah. gonna, I'm gonna take it right now. Yeah, like, yeah. <laughs> I feel like this is the kind of thing that the, I shouldn't say no to right now. Yeah, yeah. Based on what just happened. Yeah. So, what else can I say about the Thunder Max products and the team behind them? I have run the Thunder Max tuners on my fuel injected Harleys for years before I met the men behind the brand. Now, for the last five years, Thunder Max has not only supported our podcast, but have been a big supporter of everything from small events to the biggest rallies across America. For those of you who are not familiar with the Thunder Max tuners, they replaced your fuel-injected Harley ECM and O2 sensors with their proprietary ECM module and wideband O2 sensors. This allows your computer to auto-tune itself based on the readings from those wideband O2 sensors. Adding a new exhaust, cam, or big bore kit has never been easier with the Thunder Max units eliminating the need for dyno tuning and its reoccurring costs. To learn more about their products, visit thunder-max.com if you decide to make a purchase, remember to use the Fast Life offer code at checkout to save 10% on your order. Finally, don't forget to follow the team on Instagram at ThundermaxEFI. Yeah, I, I split the deer, called the tow truck. They came and got me. Fucking the cop wanted me to get off of the, the interstate that showed up to do the uh, traffic report. So I was like, what the fuck do you want me to do with this bike? He's like, I'll follow you to the gas station because like almost at an, at an exit. Yeah, I was like. Okay, but if I go down, because my front end's bent, like, don't run me over. Yeah. So, <laughs> I was, like, nursing this thing into this gas station on the off-ramp with a bent, like, the front end's all fucked but they up. They ended up totaling the bike, though, yeah, right? Yeah, they totaled the bike. Wow, yeah. that's crazy. And and so the closest big city with a Harley dealership to take it to was Omaha, Nebraska. Mm -hmm. So the tow truck takes me to Omaha, and it's the fucking College World Series. <laughs> so I'm trying to get a rental car to go home. And I was like, no, I only need it one way. Like, I'm just going to go home. They're like, all right, yeah, cool. Um, how many days? I was like, yeah, it'll take me one day to get there. Like, all right, that'd be 500 bucks. I was like, what the fuck? Yeah. Because they had no rental cars. It was a College World Series. So I was like, all right, whatever. It's going on my insurance. So. Man, that was wild, home. man. And shout out uh, House of Harley. Alex hooked yeah. me up. He came and got my bike. It's crazy. He he personally did? No, no, no. no. Just no he's guy? in charge, right? He just sends people. Oh, that's cool. <laughs> he sends a little guy in the totem We get it. Pole. But no, he went and, and House got my bike and all that stuff, so. That's cool. Yeah, that's uh, – I mean, when you went down, man – or not down, like you went through. <laughs> and that was uh, – that's just crazy, man. I always – I'm always scared of that. You yeah. know what I mean? Uh, Steve Chamberlain, obviously, he yeah. hit that deer a long time ago. Natalie Kleiner. Natalie Kleiner went through a deer once on her FXR. And I guess that's a good point. Like, you don't want to swerve. You want to just, like, like just hold on for the ride, yeah. you know? Yeah. So, yeah, that's crazy. Like, I know, like, better riders out there probably have all these tips and tricks they tell people, right? But, like, are you really going to remember that in the moment? Like, if you can remember one thing, it's, like, just try and, just try and hold it just straight. hold on, yeah. Yeah, just ride it out. 
What if you have like it was a cow? Like they'd be fucked. Right? <laughs> then you'd be fucked. Like you're not splitting a cow. But like I remember when I posted it, and like again, it's Iowa, so I was like able to walk up and down the interstate because there's no other car, there's no other cars coming. So I was like filming it. Of course, got to get yeah. it on film. Yeah. And then because you're trying to get clout. I got your clout. I got your followers. <laughs> and luckily, every all the 200 people that do follow me, like every single one of them responded and was like, yeah. My buddy hit a deer and was in a coma for like nine months. I was yeah. like, I don't want to hear this shit. Yeah. <laughs> like, I'm never gonna ride a bike again. I'm gonna go get a truck. That's fucking wild, man. But that's that's a scary thing. It's like the the wrecking on a motorcycle when you literally didn't have the control or the option to like make it right. Right. And and you saw him, like you saw the deer. It's not like he just sprung out of nowhere. Yeah. Like he, like when, like he must have just been suicidal because it's Iowa. <laughs> he's like, "Fuck it, dude, I don't want to live here no more." <laughs> so he's like, he was like timing. He's like, "Oh, you're not here yet. All right, I'm gonna go back across." I wonder if you know, it's like the sound is what's scaring him, right? So I wonder if the the like somehow the reverberations of the sound of the motorcycle or the cars. I have no idea. Might have like came from another area to make the deer think that that where he was yeah. going was where the sound was coming. That's why he was running away. It's probably that the, the old couple that was in the other land. Yeah, they were like praying that yeah. no deer would come out. So he's like, Oh shit, I can't go that way. <laughs> like this guy's all hopped up on Adderall. Fuck his body. <laughs> yeah. You end up being the, uh, yeah. the sacrifice, like the devil worshiper. Or yeah. whatever the fuck. But no, that's, that was wild when it happened, man. Like I said, it's, it's a, it's something that I think we all worry about. I try not to get in this. I, I try not to ever think about anything bad like that yeah. because it's easy to go down that rabbit hole. Like on the first day, the first couple of hours of your trip leaving out of town, yeah. Can, like you've planned this trip for a whole year. You're meeting up with your buddies and you fucking go down on the, on the ride to meet up with everybody because you're so hyped that you just not you're not paying attention. No, yeah. you know. Um, I always think about that, man. It's like how quickly like everything you're doing. I've had guys and not, not the current homies that I travel with, but in my bike club days, I had dudes like be out in the middle of nowhere and their motors would blow. And literally like they're getting, you know, uh, a fucking, you know, a tow truck and then a rental car or whatever, just to take their shit home. Their trip's over at yeah. that point. Yeah. It's like, wow, man, it's crazy to me. Like I've been fortunate to finish every trip I've ever started, but and that's a goal, right? Like that's that's got to be the the point. But yeah, it's fucking. I don't and know. I don't, like like so. My wife had had I think that morning had gotten back on the. So she she flew for some reason. I don't know why, but she flew from wherever she was. I think she had to go somewhere else. Yeah. Um. So she was on a plane. So I, I sent her a message like, "Hey, I was in a bike wreck, but I'm okay. And yeah. you know, I'll let you know when I, the tow truck's on its way. I'll let you know when I know more." And I guess I wasn't thinking about it, but that's like all I said, like just quick. And so like when she gets to the airport or when she's off of the airplane, like the whole message is just like, "Oh, yeah, I was in a bike wreck." <laughs> I'll let you know later when I'm fine. Like, I was like, oh, I guess I should have included some more details. Like, I didn't go down. I kept it yeah. up. I'm fine. Yeah, it's been crazy, man. But, you know, so what do you think this year, like, for you? Like, what do you want to try to, like, push towards or accomplish or, you know? It's not a New Year's resolution anymore. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's fucking it's March. Fucking or, March almost. Or late February, yeah. Um, I don't know, dude. I feel like, and, and it's going to sound dumb, but, like, turning 39, uh -huh. I was like, I got to start like planning like my bucket list. Like, what am I going to do before I fucking die? Yeah. <laughs> so, so like that kind of stuff. Um, gosh, I don't even know how to word it properly. Right. Cause I think like if you say certain things, you're going to sound like you're insulting people and I'm, yeah. and, I, and I'm not, but it was like, I want to know. Okay. So now I want to be like, and I think I am, but like, all right, I think I'm a good dad, but how can I be a better dad? So like I still, you know, I was like, okay, well, instead of like taking all of these bike trips, maybe I'll just take like one bike trip this year and I'll do more dad stuff, which again, sounds bad, right? Like it sounds like, oh, I'm a fucking deadbeat and just leaving my kids to go riding, which I only do sometimes. <laughs> but <laughs> like, I remember like I planned, um, so like in June when school yeah. gets out, we're going to take a car, um, me and my youngest are going to take a, uh, a road trip to Yellowstone. Oh, that'd be cool. And then my wife will fly. Um, she's not a huge road trip fan. She doesn't yeah. sit in a car that long. But then she'll fly and meet us and stuff like that. So just doing more, more of that. I stuff. think road trip stuff is important. I love road trips. Kids. Yeah, I love road tripping. Yeah. I don't think he's ready for like the Adderall portion of a road <laughs> trip yet, but that'll just be like that'll be Dad's secret. Like yeah. Dad's gotta have his coffee. Yeah. Don't boop, tell boop. mom. <laughs> don't, don't tell mom. Uh, but yeah, it's just more of that stuff. Um, and I, I think like I stopped doing four for the road. Yeah. Um, which I don't. I don't even know if 
I guess we just can't call this podcast Dave from Four for the Road anymore. We'll have to call it like Dave from the um, um, We Get It, We Know You're Rich Patreon. <laughs> you're the one that asked me if like you're going to get news. News, yeah, there better be and news. I started thinking one. maybe I should start taking pictures of like things on my body and putting it like random pictures for that. Otherwise, what are we on Patreon for, right? Isn't that what it's for? <laughs> I'll just end up putting a whole bunch of that, that the black dude with the, the large. Yeah. But I love all the guys that still like do four for the road. Yeah, I just got like myself. Yeah, it's not anything that like like it was like oh like no, I just got tired of it. Like it just it wasn't appealing to me anymore. It wasn't like yeah, it wasn't something that I wanted to do. Like my narrative or what I did changed, and you know. But it's good that instead of you sticking into something that you don't feel like you're bringing. You don't feel like you can connect with the the content anymore. Yeah. Instead of like just walking away is like the the, the thing to do, right? It's yeah. like there's nothing wrong with like growing and evolving and changing. And when I say evolving, I don't mean from a, a shitty place to a better place. I'm just everybody's evolving, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah. It's not about like, hey man, I'm just I'm not feeling this anymore. Yeah. Not that it's bad. No. It's just it's a personal but I think, thing. Uh, I think that just the reality of social media is, though, that you have to be conscious of, about how you do that stuff because people, I think people, like you talked about, you know, people might look for drama yeah. where there is none or they might want, they might want to make assumptions where there's none to be made. Yeah. It was the content that, that Four for the Road is very good at putting out didn't mesh with what I value. That's not the right word, but I wanted to do anymore. Yeah. Like, I still love the history. You know, I've still spent, you know, 10 years or, gosh, I guess more now that I think about how old I am, but, you know, <laughs> attached to motorcycle clubs. Yeah. Um, you know, I've, I've, you know, I count some of the, the, the best fucking representations of clubs. Is that light still on there? On your thing? You gotta edit this out. No, I just want to make sure. Is it still green? Yeah, yeah, cool. it's still green. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, I, I still count like some of the best dudes that are in clubs as as friends, and you know, I think that I'm um, in a very fortunate position where you know I get to have conversations about history and conversations about the current states and conversations about wants and desires and where does it go next and. What are the, what are the, you know, how are you staying attached to the roots versus also um, evolving? Yeah. Because you can stick your head in the sand, but I think most good club dudes, most good people in general know that you have to evolve. There's very much something to be said. And I think the motorcycle world in general does a great job of holding on to traditions. Yeah. But, but you also, you know, you have to be able to, to evolve. And so anyway, I think that I'm just very fortunate um, to still call those people friends and and like i said to really be and I, you know again so people are going to take this how they want but privy to conversations that maybe i have no business being a part of yeah um and i don't take that lightly like i i love being able to have that conversation in a historical context versus mm-hmm. a where we at now and what's going great and what do people wish people that matter like, what do they wish was different and, and things like that? So I appreciate that part of it. And I think that's something that as far as where are we going mm-hmm. and what are we doing well as clubs, I think Four for the Road, you know, really still does well. Yeah. But I get, you know, my my lane, I guess, to stay in my lane kind of became the alternative. Like, I wanted people to know that there's so many great things that a club can give you, but you don't need it. Yeah. Like, there's nothing that you're missing out on by not being in a club. Like, maybe you meet club dudes and you meet a club, and that, for you, is the greatest thing ever. Like, yeah. that's just, that's your home. Cool. That's awesome. Congratulations. But that doesn't mean that somebody else can't get that without that club. Yeah. Without that, being a part of that community. That's just for you. Yeah. That's what worked. But that doesn't mean that somebody else has to do that. You can find the exact same shit just riding your bike with your friends. Minus we, minus the dudes, you know what they do. <laughs> well, we talked about that a million times, how, you know, I think the club can be a, you know, it, it can be a way that easy, it, it can be an easier way to 
forcefully connect with other people, you know, no. based on if, if like the fit is right, you know, like uh, being a hang around, whatever, going around a club. I like these dudes. I want to be a part of it. And then, you, you know, you run through the gambit of what you're supposed to do to prove that as opposed to like just dudes showing up to a bike night. Sometimes, you know, they think a lot of, we see it a lot. Dudes will come to bike night. They'll come once or twice and never show up again. Yeah. And then finally they might try again and, uh, six months later and be like, oh, I just, I just didn't feel like anybody cared. I'm like, mm-hmm. we didn't. Yeah. Like who the fuck, yeah. like. And, and I think, you know, the argument for, like you're like you're talking about right now, like the argument for clubs, for, for when you talk to some club guys, and I totally get it, is the fact that there's something special and there's something bonding about earning your way into this group of people, this group of yeah. men. I get that. But you don't have to have that just with a patch. Like you said, coming to your bike nights and making an effort, that can be a way for you yeah. that you connect on that level with another human being. Mm-hmm. Okay, you've got the exact same connection. It's just different ways that you got to that point. Yeah. Um, and like you said, if they're not coming around, yeah, we didn't care because you weren't putting in the effort. It's the same concept. Same. So I think clubs do are, are still a great thing for some people. But I, my, like I said, my lane really evolved at Four for the Road from the, from the historical stuff that, yeah. I, that I, I still love to just being like, dude, you don't need this. Yeah. You're not missing out on anything. And really, if we're going to talk a little shit, I think the, the motorcycle scene... I think it's kind of like like we were talking about like social media, right? Yeah. Social media, I think, puts so much of the negative in front of you. Like you think like if you look only at social media, you know, either like the world's ending or everybody's a racist or, you know, there's only blue haired liberals that are taking over the world or whatever the case may be. Right. Like like mm-hmm. it, you really that's the um, oh, what did we call it? It's like the 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 loud minority. Yeah. Starts to seem like it's actually the majority, mm-hmm. but it's not. Um, and I think some of that that holds true for for clubs as well. Some of the most negative aspects of it, I think, it amplified. So it yeah. seems like that's what things are because that's what people buy into. That's what people people not involved in it are going to amplify that. I don't think that like. I think we were saying this. I think we were talking about this in the car. Drama is a thing that we're wired to connect ourselves with to mm-hmm. to know what's going on. To, di- to then discern whether or not it has anything to do with us or it's going to affect us before we don't want to be a part of it. Yeah. Right? So that nature, that human nature that we have to stop and look at the car wreck, yeah. you know, on the other side of the highway, it's just like I need to know. I need to, like, curve this appetite for something in my head to know what's going on. Yeah. What's going on? Is it, like, going to affect me? Is this going to, you know... And then once you realize it didn't affect you, these motherfuckers stopping to look at this car, <laughs> it's everybody else, yeah, right? But yeah, yeah. people, and I don't think anybody really truly wants to be in drama. Nobody, I inherently don't feel like it's like something everybody wants. I think inherently some people don't realize that a lot of decisions they make create drama, right? They're mm-hmm. not being self-aware that like decisions made hastily can cause a lot of backlash, yeah. right? But when you have things in the industry, like the industry or the the culture, the scene of motorcycling, drama tends to be the thing that gets the most attention because it's just the way we're wired. Yeah. But then next thing you know, said club is doing this amazing thing for this charity or this, that, or this, that, and then nobody cares. Yeah. It well, doesn't, there's nothing, good news does not affect my life. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. Bad news. Bad could. news travels fast. Yeah. Um, and good news travels slow or whatever they say. But like, you know, I think right now, I don't know if you've seen it, but like, maybe it's the weird shit I look at, but like on, on, on Instagram. Yeah. For whatever reason, there's like way more videos, or maybe people just send them to me, um, where it's like this debate of like, can you pass, if you're another motorcyclist, can you pass a club? Yeah, what's up with Shut that? Shut the fuck, yes, you could pass a fucking club. Now, if you're not, if you choose not to be a part of that culture, motorcycle club culture, their rules don't fucking apply to you. Exactly. If you decide that you want to be a part of a motorcycle club or act like a motorcycle club or be involved in that community, then you've made a conscious choice to join that or to, to join that. Yeah. Whether or not you're in a club, just say you've made a conscious choice to join that culture. Yeah. Now the rules apply to you. But if you're just a daily rider, the rules don't fucking apply. Now, what does apply 
is not being a fucking asshole. Yeah. So like you're not gonna fly up on a pack of bikes 100 miles an hour and split them up the middle, or weave in and out of the lane of a pack of bikes. But if there's a lane open and you go by them, and there's nothing wrong with that. Yeah. And I think that what gets a voice again a platform on social media for what it's worth is you know the the random club or the random dude in a club patch that like loses his shit because he got passed yeah now does like you said to your point does anybody post a video about the club that didn't care um or the club that was doing charity work like is that gonna blow up no but the guy that loses his shit because he got passed that's gonna blow up yeah. and it makes things look negative mm-hmm. but it's like again if you're not choosing to be a part of that world the rules don't apply to you. I've always said that, like, it's just to be a good human. That's it. That's the only. Yeah. Ju- that's the only rule that applies to everybody. Like, be a good person. But so that's what, going back to what we've talked about this so much in our friendship over the years about how, you know, like, I remember watching that fucking podcast y'all did with that that was that group of dudes and all the drama was going on. And oh, that like, make believe club. Yeah, yeah, that shit was. I told you, like, because you asked me, goes, "Hey, can you watch this and tell me what you thought?" I was like. I was having an anxiety attack the whole time watching that shit. Yeah. I don't like that. I don't like. I don't like watching I hate that TV episode. shows. I hated it. I, I in the moment I didn't realize it, but I hated it afterwards. Yeah. the The concept of all the club stuff, like, I think, as a person that dabbled in that world, I enjoyed it. Mm-hmm. I didn't enjoy the work that was having to be put in and the forcefulness of. You know, because when it started, like when, when I was getting it, when I started the club that I was in and, and we did all the channels that we had to do to make it legit, mm-hmm. it felt good because you always had a goal. Yeah. All right, we got to get this legit. We got to get to this yeah. point. We got to do this probationary period. Then we can get a fucking top rocker. Then we can do this and blah, blah, blah. And then you're surrounded by people that have the same passion to mm-hmm. grow as well. Mm-hmm. But in hindsight, looking at it now over 10 years later, we wanted to grow a club. We didn't, weren't trying to grow ourselves. Mm-hmm. So we were just brand ambassadors for an idea Yeah. that really, we didn't even know what that idea was. But I like what you said, like we, because I mean, for those that aren't familiar with like club traditions or whatever, like what you're explaining there is kind of what's the accepted proper protocol for starting a club Yeah. or for starting a new club or whatever permission, you know, you're doing this stuff. And if you're not, in that world, you know, if I'm not a guy that cares about motorcycle clubs and you're telling me that, I'm like, that sounds fucking, that sounds fucking stupid. I'm not, at, I'm not taking, like, I'm just wearing whatever the fuck I want to wear. I'm not asking another person yeah. for permission or going through these steps or whatever. I get that. But you, you, you made a conscious choice to join the community. So you went through these steps, you know, the right way. Yeah. And I think, again, I think that's the core difference. If you don't want to be a part of it, then nothing applies to you other than just being a good person. Mm-hmm. Like, don't split up the middle of the pack in yeah. anything because that's dangerous. Um, you know, and if you want to be a part of the community, then you adhere to the unwritten rules or whatever. Yeah. The, 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 the way the culture operates because now you've said, I want to be a part of that. And yeah. so I, I like what you said. Like, yeah, you know, it, but yeah, if it's not giving you growth, if something, if anything's not giving you growth, then eventually I think you grow out of it. If you're looking for high quality motorcycle lighting, then check out Custom Dynamics. It doesn't matter if your motorcycle has been around the block or it's fresh off the showroom floor. They offer a wide range of LED lighting options for various models, as well as custom applications. They have been in business for over 25 years and are committed to providing top-notch products at competitive prices. On my FXR Chopper, I'm running one of their custom application LED tail light strips and their industry standard 5.75 LED headlight. And on my Lowrider ST, I have been running their Pro Beam Series LED turn signals, tail light, and headlight. You can check out their website at customdynamics.com to explore the available LED lighting options for your motorcycle. And don't forget to follow them on Instagram at Custom Dynamics. Yeah, well, a, a lot of people, I mean, I'm saying this in, in, a, in a position where I, I understand that it's impossible to always know deeply every decision you make in your life, like deeply why you're making it. That's mm-hmm. something that, you know, if you ask me why I did a podcast when I started it, it's mm-hmm. not why I do it now mm-hmm. because that was revealed to me over the time of doing this podcast. So, but trying, but knowing that now, I try to go into everything with some sort of understanding as to why am I doing this? And if I'm asking myself and being honest with myself, 
If it's always like, oh, I want to, I want to get paid, I want to do this, yeah. that's fine. But be true to that. Mm-hmm. Like I'm doing this to make some money. Yeah, I'm doing this because I want to explore this idea and learn something from it. Well, then that's what that's about. Like you got to ask yourself why. Why do you want to be in a club? Yeah. Why don't you want to be in? a well, club? Well, like you said on the way on the way here, what? And I'm sure there are other examples, but what other area, what other thing can you get into where all of a sudden you're an instant badass, rebel, whatever keyword you want to throw in there, right? Anybody can fake the funk for six, nine, 12 months, whatever, and get a patch. I don't care what anybody says. Yeah. Anybody can fucking do it. If it's what you absolutely want to do to validate that you're a badass, that you're a tough guy, that whatever fucking facade you're trying to be, you'll suck it up for six months, nine yeah. months, 12 months, whatever. Because then at the end of that, you think your capital R respected and you think that fucking, you know, everybody, you know, everybody's going to bow to you or whatever. Like there's shitheads wearing patches right now yeah. in every single club, everyone. And like you said, what other thing can you do where that's instantly available to you? You mm-hmm. can't fucking throw on a tap out shirt if you don't know how to fight. Yeah. Do people still wear tap out shirts? It's like stolen valor, <laughs> right? Like, if like, you never tap yeah. somebody out, you get to wear a tap out. Shirt. You are not going to suddenly like walk into an MMA gym or jujitsu or boxing and and suddenly be a. Do badass. you think if somebody was in a straight up tap out reflective foil t shirt walking into a MMA gym, <laughs> looking like CM Punk or whatever the fuck, <laughs> do you think like the Fighters there are going to take the dude seriously? No, and I think if you wear a tap out shirt in public, you should have to defend it. It should be like, what was that shit in the 90s with wrestling? <laughs> uh, where they had like that hardcore title? Where like, you had to defend the title anywhere? Yeah. I think that's what it should be with that tap out shirt. If you're wearing that, you have to fight. And if you get that's beat, fair. you have to give up the shirt. Yeah. But no, I think that, that you know, for... And club dudes will agree to this. There's dudes that do it because they're not comfortable in who they are. Yeah. And they think that getting that patch is going to suddenly validate them or it's going to suddenly make them this badass in their mind that they weren't or that they're suddenly going to have whatever they, whatever it is. But And eventually most of them work their way out of the club. But by the end of that, how much damage has been done that the good dudes have to repair? Yeah. And yeah. how long does that take to repair the damage that one person did? Yeah. Now, if that one person makes it, let's say he's a cancer in your club for three years, four years, five years, whatever. How many other fucking pieces of shit did he bring in? Mm. That now those legitimate dudes, those good dudes, have to spend all that time cleaning that up. Well, to that point, I got a couple points to make if I can remember them as I say them. <laughs> um, to that point is the same reason why you get used to certain types of personalities like as a custom painter. Yeah. As a, as a service provider in this motorcycle game, there are certain things that you notice in personalities that I avoid letting them become a customer. Sure. And it's as simple as the way that they message me, right? Mm-hmm. If they're too this or too short or too whatever, or they don't communicate like quickly or mm-hmm. like in a, in a manner of like, you know, if I message you, you ask a question, I message you back and you answer me two weeks later, I don't have time for that much holes mm-hmm. in a, a conversation, right? So, oh fuck, I already lost where I was going with that <laughs> that statement. But a, as a club member, you you have to be a bit of a philosopher. If you're going to like hold your club and the values accountable, then you have got to start to understand personalities and look for these traits in certain people yeah. that you know where those lead to, right? Yeah. Those personality traits, even whenever I, I've caught them and I still allowed them to, to be a part of the process of doing a job together, they always cause problems. Mm-hmm. You know, And it's not so much that it's their fault. It's that they don't jam and vibe with the way shit works at my shop. Mm-hmm. Well, my shop could be my club. Mm-hmm. And if that doesn't fit, it's always going to be a problem. If they're doing this because they want to put a patch on and a fucking name tag to let them know that they're this so they can get into the fucking party for free instead of whatever. Like all these things, it's, it's, it's why ask yourself why, yeah. why are you doing this? What do you, what is it about it? Mm-hmm. You, know? you know? So they've always, why that with, club? Yeah. You know? And, and so they've always disagreed with, um, and not that it's, it's wrong. It's just, I've always looked at it differently. Cause I do think that it's, it's, it's definitely an applicable saying, but they always say, you know, kind of the play on the John F. Kennedy yeah. quote. It's like, n- yeah, you know, what can you do for the club? Absolutely. But is that club making you 
a better person. Yeah. And it's almost like that's taboo to say. Like, I think people like think that they can't express that out loud. And I disagree. Like, yes, you should be enhancing the club, but you should already know you're going to enhance the club. Are you fucking, are you in your mind? Like, I'm a piece of shit. I can't wait to get in this club and make it a piece of shit too. <laughs> like, like, what? like, what? Wow. No, like that club should absolutely, if you're going to join it, like it should absolutely have a, a why as to what it's going to do for your life. Like, yeah. why is it going to enhance your life and enhance yeah. who you are because you're going to be a more dedicated brother you're going to um enhance the culture into the next decade or whatever like you're going to leave a legacy for something whatever the case may be but yes the club absolutely should give you something back it shouldn't just be what can i do for my club yeah okay yeah. get it you know but what can the club do for you yeah and, and i don't mean that on how much money can it put in your pocket or how many bitches can you get or whatever it's can it make you a better person and if the answer is no, you probably don't need it. And and you know, I think I think it's in the motorcycle scene in general now. Mm -hmm. Everybody's a tough guy. And and you know, I jokingly say that we don't need any more lightning bolts. Yeah. We got <laughs> like we fucking got it. Yeah. Um and I'm joking. Like I, you know, there's whatever. But there's enough tough dudes. Mm -hmm. And some of the and again, if somebody, you know, disagrees with me or, or thinks I'm talking out of my ass or whatever like I'm not I'm not a the most I'm not a national president of anything or anything like that but like I know a lot of people yeah and I very fortunate like, I mean that very fortunately to, to run in a lot of circles and I you know, everybody that I know that I respect and that I think is just a great representation of what the culture should be mm -hmm. is absolutely a badass but it's the last part of their personality that comes out and you know I, I there's one guy he's absolute he's a he's a he's a he's an officer in his club he is a national representation of the brand yeah and he is one he is the best representation of that club and he's a fucking he could you know he's not he's a tough guy but you know he'll send you like goofy ass shit of like you know those um, face distortions on Snapchat or something yeah. like that. Like, he doesn't take himself that seriously. Like, mm -hmm. it's not his whole fucking personality. And that, I think, was what makes him a great representation. Yeah. His first interaction with somebody is not to mean mug them. It's yeah. not to try and intimidate you into respecting him. Yeah. It's like you're going to respect him because he's just a genuinely good, nice guy. Like yeah. That's how he conducts himself. That's how he holds himself. I'm going to go, oh, you, if you're a nice guy, you're going to... No, obviously, there's a place and a time for anything. But I think when you hold yourself to just that different standard of being a compassionate person, a, an educated person, a, a person that listens and, and then speaks, yeah, people gravitate towards that. And those, I think, are the best representation. And I don't think they get a large enough platform to represent the club community. That's fair. That's hundred percent fair. You go into anything being a student, and you know, you you're going to certainly grow, but you're going to gravitate to the people that feel like provide you with the most value. Because mm -hmm. there's always those like more in a club. You know, the bike, the motorcycle, typically is what brings everybody together, and it forms a club or it forms a group of friends based on said reason why or what they want to do on that bike. Mm -hmm. You know, it could be traveling. It could be like. You know, we just, we want our own cheers. We want our own this. We want our own that, whatever. But the other thing is, like, I think you had tap, tapped on a little earlier. Is it like... Did I, did I tap out? <laughs> not, not yet. <laughs> um, is the, the concept of, like, I think that, like, I don't want my podcast to turn into some fucking mental health thing for that because the shit's all fucking... I, I hate even talking about it. But people need to allow themselves to like start to like when they feel like the things aren't happy or the, mm -hmm. the things they don't like what's going on to start looking for something else like mm -hmm. to start putting out there you know and not feel like they need to fucking just be staunch on who they are being they don't change i never i've been like this my entire life brother <laughs> I, i'm still this guy you like like evolve or die bro like yeah well it's like evolve it, it evolve sometimes makes it feel like it's it's not your choice it's mm -hmm. like you have to evolve with the times or the or the culture. I'm saying 
personal growth, like figure out. Like but that once, isn't personal growth. I think it, it is. is evolving. It, 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 I mean, inherently, yes, it is evolving. But I think of sometimes the word gets attached to like an involuntary thing. Sure, right? sure, sure, sure. Um, but being like being honest with yourself, like I've always, I never knew knew that I did this. But in motorcycling, when I got tired or uninspired by a scene. I found something else in motorcycling to keep my my tank full. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah. And that's not necessarily like in the later part of my my years, it's been people, mm-hmm. right? The people that surround myself help fill my tank to ride and do more. But early on, it was like I thought, oh man, I really like that the stunt scene. It's fun. I think I can do some willies. Mm-hmm. Uh, I I'm scared if I wreck and break my hand, then I can't paint. Maybe I can just race them. Mm-hmm. I don't have enough money to race. I guess I'll just make cool looking bikes. You mm-hmm. know what I mean? So you look for these different scenes to be a part of to give you a purpose, right? Because that's one of the first things as a as a man, as a person, you need to figure out your own personal purpose. Yeah. Uh, you know, to to continue to live, but also to keep you like growing and, and learning and becoming a better person or just becoming a more skilled person mm-hmm. or whatever. But that's one of the things that, like, in my circles of uh, friends at bike nights, and I hope it doesn't start to come off super fucking gay, but I do want, I want to hear my friends tell me what they want to be better at. I what? asked you that this j- earlier, like, what is 2024 yeah. for you? I'm asking that because I want people to want more, you know? not I, Make the motorcycle club scene gay again. But <laughs> <laughs> Like I think what was the what was the San Francisco club the satires or the well in Chicago in Chicago because Chicago's nickname is the Second City Uh a long time ago I mean years ago there was a a gay a gay motorcycle club an all male motorcycle club called Second City oh because I heard about the one that was from San San Francisco that was like that it was probably I mean I don't know isn't it like a one percent club that was satire or it was a sapphire some weird shit like that I don't know. The only uh, my limited knowledge of gay clubs <laughs> goes to my local Great Lakes. Yeah, clubs. it goes to my Great Lakes region. Right, if you're gay in the Great, <laughs> if you're gay in the Great Lakes region, I've already, I know you. I've yeah, I know you. Dive, I know yeah. you. All right, I've been to your house. <laughs> we parted. Um, but no, I think that you're you're absolutely honest. Like like again, I don't want to sound like I'm I'm tooting my own horn. Like I'm very respectful of the relationships I have, and I'm very fortunate to have the relationships that I have. Yeah. But I know a lot of fucking people, and I know a lot uh, in the club world. And again, I'm just, I'm so, I don't take that for granted. So fortunate. But those dudes, again, I think they're they're on that same sort of mind. The dude that I introduced you yesterday, yesterday, I wish he could do a podcast because the, he's so articulate. And the shit yeah. that he says about how he's tried to evolve this massive, you know, large, top-tier club that he's in nation i mean it's a it's a it's a worldwide club yeah and the 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 insight and the thoughts that he'll share about the influence that he's tried to be and the things that he's tried to teach younger people and the conversations he's had to try and help older members evolve out of their kind of staunch ways that maybe aren't always best or whatever you know i mean he just gets it and i think black people are free yeah (laughs) wait what oh man We, we we're mixing the colors now (laughs) <laughs> um, I wish that he, you know people like that could have a louder a louder platform. Yeah, um, well, we've always said that, right? We've always said like, man, if there was a way for, and I think you said it best, articulated it the best way is like, if clubs could be ahead of the narrative, like they can write the narrative in their own way instead of allowing the rest of the world to write it, right? The everybody else. You know, they, they they put their beanie down below their eyes. They do a YouTube channel and they talk about club shit like it's TMZ. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. And lots of views. Why? Because people like drama. De- and they, Demons Row is fucking gay. I don't know. You can edit that out if you want. No, nah, I don't I even know who that, that is. Guy. But just the point is like all that stuff is. Well, you're trying to make money. And and so. So, know, that, so that so that's my point. It's clickbait. That's why I now in this later year, like. I, if you would ask me this in 2018, 19, 20, um, I would say, yeah, yeah, clubs need to get ahead of it. But now it's like the way that the internet takes any kind of information yeah. and re- redistributes it or people cla- like latch onto it and they fucking like mine it for everything it's worth. That club culture, that that some of those like things that the clubs won't allow their members to like talk about, 
at this point, I agree with it. Yeah. I, I agree that like some of that stuff, if you let the world know about every little thing or every little why, yeah, it, it gives the world too much knowledge about what you're doing. And sure. right now, we have no privacy. And it's like a version of privacy that maybe four years ago we felt like, or I felt like, we had more privacies in our life. Now I feel like we have less, right? So if you don't know what's going on in, in the club world, in, in a sense, like they have the ability to, you know, kind of, there's, I guess I'm, it sounds like I'm running around in a circle no, get, here. But they can insulate themselves. Yeah, they can insulate themselves from whatever narrative is out there because they don't know for sure. Well, which was the appeal, I think, of clubs in, you know, let's say the 60s or the 70s, right? It was we don't give a fuck about society and, and we're not going to, we just want to be left alone because we're not going to come over there to straight society and we're not going to blend there. So, so don't come over here and try to tell us what to do and, and we'll all be fine. Right. Yeah. Like they wanted to operate with that anonymity. Like you don't know what we do and we're not going to share what we do. And if anything, we're going to look, we're going to look so offensive that you don't even want to talk to us. Cause yeah. that's how we want to be. We just want to be left alone. Cause they felt like outcasts. And I think a lot of that culture came from the fact that those members were predominantly in that era. You know, Viet- I mean, people don't realize the Vietnam War in, you know, started in 1957. Yeah. Somebody's going to fact check me on that. But, you know, as far as American advisors going to Vietnam, it was probably 55, 56, 57, somewhere in there. And then went until, what, 1974, three, five? Okay, so almost 20 years. So you have this, this generation of vets coming home that felt disenfranchised. They felt unappreciated. They felt misunderstood. They're, they're discriminated against in the workplace. They're, they feel like their contributions, the loss of their brothers, like all of this is not at least acknowledged by the American public. They're, they're, they're spit on or whatever. So what's the draw? What's something that they can go... They don't have tap-out shirts yet, so what's something that... <laughs> What's something that they can go do yeah. where they can be with like-minded individuals and also be left alone? And that's this explosion in clubs. Yeah. But if you look before then, you know, that was just a different era for clubs. And clubs are like anything else. They're evolving. There's, so if you look at, at the anthropology of clubs, like there's just so many different eras that could be divided. You know, like this is... What would you say is the, is the time frame when the clubs really started to change from like... Being rowdy in the '60s and '70s, or maybe part of the '70s, when do you think it really started to change into being the violence of what I think a lot of clubs became known well, for? <laughs> Gosh, I don't know. I don't know if I'm educated on this, but I will say I think that obviously, um, it seemed like the late '70s, '80s was like a volatile <laughs> year for that. Yeah, I think that. Um, and and there's people that are gonna say you're you're a fucking pussy for dancing around it, and I get that, and 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 I also you know I didn't live that era, so yeah. how much of an you know I've always been a student of the history, but I think that you had again you had this subculture that felt disenfranchised, and and people could say what they want about World War II veterans, I don't think that World War II veterans that came back and started motorcycle clubs felt the same disenfranchisement that that Vietnam era veterans. Okay. I think they felt that's fair. They felt unfulfilled. Because war is so fucking exciting, for lack of a better term, right? Yeah. It's it's this adrenaline dump on the highest level. And so the, the the World War II vets, they came back, but they didn't really necessarily figure out how they could fill that void. But they weren't, they were heroes. Chicks wanted to fuck them. The government was giving them home loans. Like, you know, there was this, all of a sudden they'd come out of the Great Depression and then the, 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 the war machine had created this economy. So now jobs are booming and all this stuff. Like, it wasn't the same mm-hmm. as Vietnam era. So all of a sudden, the, these Vietnam era vets that joined clubs, it kind of changed to, you know, if, if people want to admit it or not, clubs in the 40s were very much working families. Like, you know, they had their own thing. Like they had their clubs, they raced, they got together, they loved their brothers, they did all this shit, but, you know, a lot of them held jobs and had families and, and maybe they're in the club. It wasn't uncommon for people to be in a club for a year, two years, three years, leave and, and, and go on to something else. And it's like now it's almost because, well, you can't leave. Why yeah. the fuck would you ever leave? But it wasn't always like that. But anyway, so again, well, you there's have... no legal ties to it. <laughs> <laughs> so now you can't have... Can't take these secrets with you, yeah, bro. yeah. We got a we got a we got a uh, a settling torture yeah. back off, dude. 
So now you have, again, you have this more pissed off generation. Yeah. That sacrifice, and I get it. They sacrificed so much. They saw their, their brothers die. And then they, they were under, they were unappreciated. So all of a sudden they start like this more communal living. They just want to ride their bikes. They don't want to have a straight job. They don't want to contribute to society. They want to just be amongst these people that understand them. They want to have a good time. They've earned a good time. They're going to fucking party. They've earned it, right? So all of a sudden they, they're buying, you know, clubhouses and, and all these kind of stuff. And, and dudes are hanging out. And maybe five, six, seven dudes are living in that house together. And, and it's real communal living. And especially the 60s and the 70s, you're talking about the influence of the hippie cultures yeah. and, and things like that. So communal living is not this weird idea. Like, it's, it's got traction. Yeah. How are you going to pay for that? They don't want jobs. Might sell drugs. Not everybody. Some people are going to sell drugs. Yeah, I mean, back then, it was like when it started, it was probably LSD. It's and, more of the psychedelic kind of drugs. Yeah. And, weed and, and shit like that. And, and the, the idea of the modern workforce with a 401k and PTO and all this shit, that wasn't mainstream in the 60s and 70s. Yeah. So if you want to ride cross country on your busted ass chopper and you want to have a good time and you want to, you want to do a little drugs, you want to drink a little beer, you need money. How are you going to get it? You're going to deal some of those drugs, right? So... What happened? And whether or not you agree with the 80s and the war on drugs and Reagan and, and all that stuff, all of a sudden these laws became enacted to where just a small amount of, of cocaine. Look at white boy Rick, right? Like yeah. you get you a life, a life sentence. So these guys that were communal living, they were selling drugs. You know, Now all of a sudden they're looking at life sentences. So now the prison – or at least – Longer sense. There's now prison culture becomes yeah. a thing. And so now, you know, drug sales become a thing. So somebody coming in and, and taking away profits that you could be making. Well, you can't stand for that. And then, you know, you are in this top tier club. So really the idea exploded in the 60s. Like you don't, in the 40s and the 50s, there isn't a 1% culture. It doesn't mm -hmm. happen until very early in, in the 1960s. So now all of a sudden you've got this idea that I'm the top dog. How do I support my brothers and how do I do this stuff? Maybe I sell a little, little something on the side, okay? Well, now you want to come in and you want to say that you're top tier. You want to take away some of my profits. Can't have that. Mm -hmm. I mean, And whether people want to admit that or not, I'm not saying that was, was across the board, but there's a large part of what happened mm -hmm. in the 70s and 80s that created, you Google it, like yeah. the car bombings and the shootings and 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 all that kind of stuff and and it enacted these laws to where just associating can you know civil asset forfeitures and you know these long prison sentences and all this stuff. and i think it's almost again i don't think that it gets enough publicity but it's changed today where guys are focused on their 401ks again and guys are holding straight jobs and guys are good dads and good family men and stuff mm -hmm. like that like there's a dude that is in a very prominent club well known, and like his Instagram page will like have him like riding his his bicycle around the neighborhood with his daughter. Like yeah. I love that shit. Like that shit should be the shit that goes viral, and it's not. It's gonna be the fucking dumb shit motherfucker that's talking like this is gangland because he's been a, a, a in a diamond club for a week. Mm. Like, yeah, because that's probably what inspired him to want to get there. Not the idea of being a part of this long legacy of this or whatever um but for me like you know the club culture that i think that i've grown to love a lot and be inspired by is kind of like your your chopper clubs right yeah. and i'm sorry guys i'm saying the word chopper again it's gonna be a hot topic but you're turning into a bit of a chopper guy i'm right? trying not to it's not yeah, it's i don't got you it's got you i i it's not the bike it's it's the things around it yeah, that I, get I, it. I love and well, I think I've been, I've been doing so much deep dive. Yeah, I want on, you to explain. I want you to expand on this because we were talking earlier. Yeah. I think chopper guys fall victim to almost some of that same stereotyping that happens to clubs. And I'm not talking about chopper clubs. I'm just yeah. saying chopper guys to where you think that chopper dudes are fucking douchebag hipsters and all that shit. When really, there's a lot of fucking awesome artists that are operating yeah. in the chopper scene. Exactly. Um, the the L four stereo thing. Uh, I remember the first time. I mean, I, I saw Twenty One Days like right when it came out. Yeah, yeah. But I remember a good buddy of mine, Tony Love. He's out of Minnesota. He came to Giddy Up one year, and he had a he had a L four stereo hoodie, and it said like Choppers, motherfucker. Yeah, yeah, it. yeah. And I have to say it that way because I read it that way. Yeah. You know what I mean? And I just I didn't really I never knew that there were 
these clubs that were based on solely like you had to have a chopper mm -hmm. to be in the club. And they were guys like well, Foresteros were like technically 1% clubs. Then you tie into the whole David Mann and, uh, you know, Tom Fugel thing. And then I have a whole wall of David Mann paintings in my yeah. shop. Now it's like, that's what I'm in love with. Mm -hmm. That's the culture that I want to share. That's mm -hmm. the, the everything, mm -hmm. right? You know, as an artist or an aspiring artist, like you want to make something for the motorcycle culture that lives longer than my Instagram account will. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like I don't like if I have a wall in my shop full of David Mann prints from actual magazines. Mm -hmm. Right. It, like I can't do that with Instagram posts. No. You know what I mean? I guess you could print them off, but no, it's not. I mean, yeah, you could print them off, but like yeah. printing them off myself and putting them off on the wall is one thing, but I have to go find these things in these old magazines. Mm -hmm. And and the other crazy thing is how many people, when they saw I started making this wall, mm -hmm. they started sending me their extras. Mm -hmm. So now I have a pack of extras that I'm waiting to give to the right guy. Yeah. It's like trading the chopper parts, right? It's like, you know, instead of like looking at this, oh, I... I got a set of uh, Lindahl rotors that uh, they're still good. I'm just not going to use them. I'm doing this over here. or I got new ones or whatever. Instead of looking at those like, oh, those are probably still worth about 800 bucks. Like you just hold on to them, wait for the right guy to come around. Be like, hey, man, take these. You know what I mean? Like mm -hmm. that. Oh, man, there's like so much. There's so many like little nuanced things that, that can make this world so much better when you take away the money. But you take away the money when people start adding their time, energy, and effort into it. That's the value that I yeah, see. That's worth more than money. Yeah. Yeah. yeah because yeah. if they're not going to give me their time, energy, and attention, then the only thing I'm going to need from them is the money. Yeah. Right. And I think, like you said, or, or like we talked about, you know, make dudes gay again. <laughs> like, like promote the dude. Like instead of the dude that's got the fucking most coolest saying about telling somebody or a saying about telling somebody to fuck off. Instead of like liking his shit on social media, like taking like your, like like your blanket, over like here. like the dude fucking bike riding with his daughter, yeah, like the dude that's taking pictures of sunsets, like whatever, like fucking take more sunsets. I don't give a fuck. But uh, this 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 yeah. fucking Rambo shit is just, it's killing the <laughs> culture, bro. It's not cool. Yeah, and nobody gives a fuck, and and I feel like somebody can come beat me up if they don't like it. But most of the guys that have that hard that have to that have to let you know that they have a hard persona, they're not hard. Yeah. And they're ruining what's an, a beautiful thing. And I think, you know, you don't want to turn this into a mental health podcast, but I think dudes need to be okay with being like, shit's pretty. Shit's beautiful. Yeah. I feel a certain way about this. I like to collect pictures. I like to write. I like to ride at night for sunsets or for early sunrise. Like, I think that shouldn't, like, be okay expressing that. Probably yeah. makes you a lot better than it is. I tell you what, like you know, going to bike night and bitching about your old lady is fun, <laughs> uh, but because there's a lot of people looking for those similarities, because that's a problem. And if you can talk about the problem, then yeah. you might hear someone else's solution or what they did to get through it. Yeah. Because the human, the human experience, as different and unique as it is for everybody, it's still kind of the same for everybody, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Um, but the other thing is like. I've been having a lot of people reach out to me and saying, hey, man, it looks like you and your wife are like way like it's just looks different. I'm like, yeah, dude, we're like best friends now. Ten years into our relationship. Yeah. We're finally best friends, you know, and that's weird. Mm -hmm. Right. And because also I thought we were best friends, but yeah. it never felt the way it felt now. But I think when now. you. I've been married almost 10 years too. And I think when you get to that point, yeah. I feel like if you're being honest with yourself, yeah, look, dude, if we didn't almost break up like five times. Over this ten years, like, did you really have yeah. have a marriage? I think that's part of of growing together. Like, I think that uh, I'm very honest in the fact that things haven't always been perfect for me. And and you know, I think sometimes guys like we want to like, oh, what as a man, uh, I just need to to fix it, or I I'm the problem, or whatever. Like, I think there's a lot of like pressure to think like the man is wrong. Yeah, and I'm not saying anything, I love my wife. I'm not saying anything negative, but sometimes 
sometimes bitches suck too. <laughs> like yeah. it's not like every single time that you're in a a a down state of your marriage or your relationship that it's your fault. Yeah. Sometimes it's that girl's fault. Well, but the I, good ones make it back up. Yeah. You make it back yeah. up. Well, you gotta understand that everybody goes through their ups and downs, and mm-hmm. like you start to you when you start to be self aware of like your ups and downs, then the people around you, you realize that, oh, they also have that as well. Mm-hmm. Your friends also have that as well. It's like nobody can be perfect all the time, right? Yeah. Or the the version of them that you love the most all the time, mm-hmm. you know? And that's one of those things that, like, you know, my wife went through a fucking phase for, like, a year and a half where I was like, God damn, dude, you're making it so fucking hard, <laughs> right? But... I was not making it easy either, Mm -hmm. you know, because Mm -hmm. the way I reacted to everything going on, it made it harder. And it was like, it was compounding interest of making shit harder. And, you know, taking a step back and, you know, like really assessing things and, and trying to be a better listener or just trying to realize what that person needs from me and trying to be more of that without selling my soul. Right. Um, and same thing with friendships, man. Like friendships are like, I've, I've said this since the day we had this podcast or I started the podcast is like people, they, they take friendships for granted mm-hmm. so much because friends don't really ask for much. They really don't. They're, they're kind of there when you need them and they're there when you don't. Right. But then again, when you don't you you don't realize like what you, you provide for that person as well. Eventually, they they start to gravitate a different direction, and then when you need them again, they're not there anymore. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Yeah. Friendships are like I don't know, man. I, I feel like friendships are one of those. Uh, Everybody needs to be appreciated. Friendships included. Yeah. That's why, like, we've always kept the bike night at once a week because for once a week, and that could be a lot for certain people. That could be not enough for others. But for once a week, you know that if you come to this place, you can hang out with a couple guys that like bikes who are kind of probably all feeding off each other's like interest and energy and enthusiasm. And it gives you a chance to like be around other like men that you actually dig. Yeah. There's women there too. Um, we don't listen to them. <laughs> no, uh, did my wife's boyfriends that are coming around bike night? Yeah. Got fuck. I was like, yeah, go home. Fucking weird. But you know, like that's a simple thing. Like I see my wife every fucking night. You know what I mean? I can't, you know, break away for, you know, two hours out of the entire week to go spend time with friends. I mean, we're really pivoted away from clubs here, but yeah, dude, when you get to a certain point in your marriage, sometimes, like, my wife, she works, she travels for work. Sometimes when she's gone, I'm like, a, she'll be gone like a Wednesday, Thursday. Yeah. Like, oh, yeah. Yeah. I'm not running to the bars like whoring around. I'm ordering a Little Caesars pizza in my underwear, like watching Iron Eagle. Like that's the greatest <laughs> shit. Like fuck yeah, dude. This is yeah. great. Don't have to erase your browser history. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like texting her about it, like, babe, you're Check not this. gonna believe what I found on Pornhub. Like, <laughs> this shit's amazing. I'm like, can you stay another day? Can we try this later? Like, uh, we got to the point now, and, and I'm not saying that it works for, for everybody, but like, you know, I felt bad. Because I would take motorcycle trips alone. Mm-hmm. And I said, she never complained. She never complained or anything like that. Um, but it was always something like I was able to do for me. And then <clears throat> we would obviously do the family trips and stuff like that. And, and we're very fortunate to do that. But I was like, do you want to go anywhere? Yeah. And I was like, is there a friend that you want to go on a trip with or something like that? And she has friends, but like she's not the kind of person that wants to spend like a week in a hotel room and like a shitty super eight. Like I don't mind. Like if you and I yeah. went on a bike trip and wanted to spend a week in different suit and getting bed bugs and different super eights. Yeah. I'm there down South. Yeah. <laughs> She's not going to do that. So, you know, I was like, just like, so now she like, she'll do like a trip to like, um, like last year she went to this all inclusive thing in Mexico. Just by herself. Just hung out. Like, I don't know if she was doing a pool boy. I assume not, but like, like you have to, after nine years, you give that trust. Like, all right, mm-hmm. go do this. Like if our marriage sucks and I'm doing pool boys or you're doing pool boys, like, all right, well, I guess we'll cross that bridge when we get to it. Yeah. But, um, you know, and then, you know, she went to Florida one year, whatever. And like, yeah, take something for yourself too. Like, it's not just, we're not going to be in a good place if we try to keep doing the same shit. Yeah. Over and over. I think that's sometimes like when you're on the verge of like breaking up or divorce, it's like, oh, because you've been in a rut, you're doing the same shit. And then all of a sudden you like 
think outside the box and things get better. Mm, yeah. No, that's a good point. Like, I've always told my wife, like, hey, you know, there's nothing, like, first off, like, there's a lot of things. Uh, it's a it's a whole other podcast as to how I was able to get into this relationship and not have insecurities, mm-hmm. to not ever be jealous, to not ever have any problems. Yeah. And a lot of that had to do with the fact that I lived a life of honesty with it. The first time in my entire life, um, you know, a very faithful person in yeah. my, my marriage, right? And so by doing so, it allows me to have like this, it, it just created a different type of confidence in a relationship. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I could still, I, I mean, right now my wife could probably be fucking having, you know, an orgy. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm here yeah, for yeah. the gangbang. Yeah, you yeah, know? yeah. But the, the point is, is that like you, you get older and, you know, you, you start to realize like, hey, uh, if I, the amount of time in my 20s I spent worrying that my old lady was cheating and because so I cheated, just in case, yeah, you yeah. know, preemptive, got yeah. that preemptive shit. She there. fucked me over, yeah. but I fucked somebody too. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I, I I couldn't grow in life. I no. couldn't focus on any of the things in life that I really wanted to be good at. And when I found my wife, I be I was able to focus because I had a, a solid home. And it's only gotten better. I mean, we've had to work. It wasn't like it was fucking perfect from day oh, one. Oh yeah, absolutely. But the other thing is like, I remember. Like early on, and I and I did this too. It's like dudes would be cheated on, right? And then they would stay with the chick, and then make the chick change everything in her life. Mm-hmm. You, you know, join account on Instagram, yeah. fucking or Facebook, and all these things, and you got to do this. And I'd always tell him. I, I remember multiple conversations in my life telling a dude that you know when he finally broke up and told us what what was going on and what he's doing to make himself feel okay about it mm-hmm. i'm like so your your chick had none of these rules and she cheated on you right and now but she wants to stay with you because she's also scared of like whatever comfort that y'all have created together you make all these new rules that she has to abide by to make you feel okay so that she won't cheat on you again yeah you're kind of gonna make her cheat on you again, dude. <laughs> she's gonna, she, she's probably cheating on you right now. Do you know where she's at? I was like, dude, like, if I always say this to people, like, if your old lady or you or whatever, if somebody fucks up, you have to, this is the hardest thing anybody could do. If you decide to stay and you say, hey, are we gonna do this or not? And it's like, I don't wanna, I'm sorry, I fucked up, blah, 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 whatever. You got to fucking take it right there. And that's the end of that conversation yeah. ever. If yeah. you bring it up two weeks later because you're insecure at that moment, like that will never let you have to fully get past that thing. Right. And nobody ever does. And right? I think like, like, you know, every country song ever, it's like the cool thing for the dude to like beat themselves up. Like I did something wrong and I did this and I did that. And I just think that, you know, <sighs> shit happens. And there is no playbook to how a perfect relationship is supposed to go. Yeah. And a perfect relationship, was that your wedding ring? Yeah. <laughs> Wait, was it actually? Yeah. <laughs> Did we in this hotel room and I didn't wear your wedding ring? Oh, well, shit. Well, you know, in case I don't want to There's no st- law against dude smashing. I didn't want to get stuck in your booty. Dude. <laughs> <laughs> but I think there's like this pressure that like if there's something wrong, it's got to be your fault. And you have to drink a lot and beat yourself up over it and, and all that kind of shit. Yeah. And and I don't think that that's like, first of all, they can fuck up and you don't have to beat yourself up over it. Yeah. Second of all, you can make mistakes and then try to work past it and not beat yourself up over it. Like like in nine years of marriage, you know, it hasn't always been good. Mm-hmm. I fucked up. I cheated and mm-hmm. we stayed together. And it's like exactly like you said, like you're either going to make a conscious decision that that you're going to work on it and you're going to stay together or you're just going to fucking yeah. call it quits. And then whatever you do, you have to stick to. Cause like you said, if you start making all these fucking new rules and all this shit, it's not going to work. And so we never had a, we never had to make a joint account or any of this shit. It was like, you know, you, you atone for it and you say, you know, whatever you want to do to make it work together you have to be okay yeah. with. Well, and, and I will not say one person this. can dictate to you. Yeah, you can't dictate. It's got to be a thing. It's like if you if it gets to that point, and then they make all these rules that you have to abide by to make them feel comfortable, then that's not going to work. But you have to make the conscious decision. Okay, 
I have to prove my – I'm the one that fucked up. Yeah. I don't want this to go away. Yeah. How do I provide – her or him comfort, mm -hmm. right? And, and you have to allow them to make the decision. Yeah. Like, I can't, and I didn't, like, be in your face about how sorry I am. And if I didn't buy you flowers every single day of the year before, you can't start that. Yeah. And and so you have to allow them the opportunity to, to you know, walk away if they want. You can't mm -hmm. try and, and change their mind because you made the mistake. Now, you can you can show how you're going to change, which hopefully I did. I, I think I have. We've been married for nine years. Yeah. Um, but again, you have to allow them the opportunity to come to whatever decision they're going to come to without, like you, like you said, making these new rules or these things. And, and to her credit, either, she didn't – there's no joint Facebook account. There's nothing like that. I mean, she didn't – as far as I know, maybe when I'm sleeping, there's no code on my phone, so she can go through yeah. it anytime she wants. Same. But she doesn't. I don't, like, come home, and she's like, let me see your phone. So unless she does it when I'm sleeping, like, you know. It's yeah. like Because, again, you can't, if you keep bringing it up like that, like, you're just – Yeah, yeah. Eventually, it's going to fucking implode. Yeah, I always I, – I think I've said on the podcast many times, but in my club, the first bike trip we ever did together, we all went to Vegas, and we all had one big, like, hotel room in, like, the Bellagio or some shit. I got my first kid. Go on. <laughs> and – uh <laughs> I, I swear to God, like to you and everybody that's ever listened to, like I've I've never my wife I've never done anything wrong, mm. right? And but I'm a fucking president of a motorcycle club. Not but I'm not gonna say like but I had to have sex with this one guy. Oh yeah, that always sounds uh, like the kind of guy we don't like, right? Yeah. Uh, but no, so you know we have this big ass room, and then other dudes are at different points in their lives. I, I'm not a strip club guy, you know. I enjoy the premise of them, and I wish they looked like they do on TV, but when I go to them now, <laughs> it's usually a white girl with fucking corn rolls and yeah. has tattoos that say Daryl or some shit on it, you know? <laughs> it's uh, it's weird. I just, I'm not fucking into it. I don't want to – whatever. But so we're at this hotel, and then we all get separated. There's a couple of dudes over here, a couple of dudes over here, and uh, I'm not a gambler. Some of the dudes were gambling. And then we all, like, I'm like, all right, I'm going back up to the room. Go up to the room, I'm chilling, and I'm just, like, on my phone, just whatever, like, trying to fall asleep or whatever. And then in walks four rowdy, loud dudes ready to party with a chick. One chick. One chick. Ah, here we go. And so <laughs> as the president, as the dude, do I go, no. <laughs> nuh <-uh. laughs> Get out of here, bitch. Fred's, Fred's <laughs> is trying to sleep, right? But so I'm like, all right, how do we play this? All right, whatever. So I just lean into it. Like, girl's here. What's going on? Like, all right. I, I just, I'm just like kind of dumbfounded by the whole situation, but I'm not like, whatever. Next thing you know, uh, girls damn near butt naked in the room, um, taking pictures. But here's the deal. I'm the one laying in bed. Therefore, my vest is not on. So when this girl gets naked, she grabs my vest, puts I've my vest. I've seen this on. episode of SOA. Exactly. And I'm, you know, I'm not like, no, 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 bitch. I got, you know, I'm like, <laughs> I'm just like going with the flow because at this point, I don't know, I don't want to be the fucking one dude in the room that doesn't want the the stripper in. Well, here. as a motorcycle club, did you rob her afterwards? Because I think that's protocol. She robbed me. Okay, that's also so protocol. No, I'll I'll tell, make, a get, make a stripper protocol. I'm going to get to where this, this is where it gets really fun. So, um, this all takes place, uh, you know, the fucking chick has my vest on. There's no pictures of her with me um, or anything, but has my vest on. The homies grab my phone, take pictures with it. I delete them, but this is right when the <laughs> iPhone decides to, like, deleted photos were... 30 days in a in a folder yeah. before you had to have your face to fucking open that folder, right? So my wife finds out about it. It's a crazy deal. But here's what happened. Homegirl realized real quick that nobody was about to pay for pussy or anything. So my wallet was on the fucking nightstand. She fucking slipped my ID and all my cash, which I had about $800 in cash in there. So took that shit. We ended up locking her in the room because we knew she took the money and she wouldn't give it to us, but we were trying to keep our hands off of her. So one of my other dudes goes, he act, he picks up the phone and acts like he's talking to the front desk and says, hey, can you send up somebody? We have a chick trying to steal from us right now. Homegirl gets scared as fuck. 
gives me my cash back but keeps my ID. To this day, some people have my some some pimp out there has my ID, <laughs> right? But we had to hold this bitch hostage in a room to get my shit back, you know, to the point where like, you know, I didn't really have a credit that that cash was getting me home. Yeah. You know what I mean? And um it was just a wild situation. And when I got home from it, I was just like, all right, cool, you know, and then a, a month later, what the fuck? <laughs> <laughs> So that took some time to get past, but the same thing I had to tell was like, look, I didn't do anything wrong. Yeah. I'm, well, I was in a place and I played no, the I card mean, no, the best I, don't, I could. Yeah, I get it. But I didn't, I didn't fuck her. I didn't do any of that yeah. shit. What it looks like is bad because of the lens that you're seeing it through. But, you know, just know that, like, I didn't do anything. I didn't have sex with this girl. I didn't do any of that shit. So um, and I told my wife, I was like, look, you're going to have to accept my apology yeah. or, or not. Yeah. It's it's on you. I cannot, I cannot do anything other than just tell you what happened, why I didn't want. I mean, I I wouldn't. I don't want to tell you that. And honestly, if you were in a similar situation, I don't want to know that. I want to hope that you didn't fuck the dude, but I don't want to know it. I don't, I'd rather just those things don't exist in my mind. Yeah. Period. So, yeah, I just you know like that's how we solved it. It took it it caused some it caused a rift for about a year. You know, to get past that. But, you know, it's like that's what's hard about this shit. It's like in a real relationship, like a year could be the hill time. It doesn't mean that for a year it was horrible, that we were yeah. fighting and, you know, whatever. It means that, like, you'll have two weeks of good shit and then maybe a couple of days of, like, depressiveness or, or or whatever. And then you go back and it's like this, like, wave of up and down and shit. So, obviously, you're the guy that I've always leaned into because of, like, your passion for writing, reading uh, you know, which has always been something I wanted to be better at, and I'm still learning to be a better reader. It's very hard for me. I have dyslexia and all that shit. And I think like a lot of people, sometimes I drift off in my mind when I read. So sometimes I have to go back and read mm-hmm, mm-hmm. a whole page because I don't I didn't retain it. I was yeah. just doing the thing but not thinking about what I was reading. Yeah. Right. But I want to be better at it. So I've been making fucking efforts to do it and being okay if it takes two months to read a book. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? I did buy... Uh, did you read those books I sent you? Yes, the All fucking right. uh, the, the Indian stuff. Yeah, and then you're like, I don't even like Indians. No, fuck <laughs> Native Americans. No, I am a Native American dude. You're like, what? Standing Rock? Stand this dick. <laughs> no, it's a... Uh, it's it's one of those things that like uh, amongst many like having and re- realigning certain things in my life to be able to spend time doing that. Yeah. A because guys like Corey from Main Drive have, have told me a lot that like reading will help me speak better. Yeah. And I want to be a better talker. Obviously, I do a podcast. I want to be the best version of me on a podcast. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And. But I mean, you're doing the vlogs and stuff too. I don't know if you're yeah. keep leaning into those, yeah, but yeah. those. I, I, I'm I'm still trying to find my groove in that. Yeah, you know. Galen said they suck, but whatever. <laughs> That's cool. That's <laughs> server, whatever, dude. Whatever, nerd. <laughs> um, the what I like about what you do is, and I've always loved this about you because it's always been like you have this like layer of like deflecting a lot of everything, but then you once you get past that in conversation, you have so much knowledge and history and you know how to write and put it down. And as a, like, to me, I, I want, like I said earlier, I want to like push my friends to make things that are cool. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Now that four for the road's not on your plate and and all the little things that you had going on with like uh sucker free MC a long time ago, like, what do you, how do you, what do you do now to take all this knowledge that you've like absorbed and all this experience that you've like had, and I know that you have this in you to get out yeah. and preach a little bit, not preach, but like, you know, educate and just put some thoughts out there to give people, get other people thinking, you know? I don't know. I, I guess call it a midlife crisis, but again, I feel like when I, I turned 39, mm-hmm. it was like I almost wanted to make a more conscious effort. I, don't, I hope anyway, I, I hope. That I was never like a, a, a dick before because I have no reason to be a dick. But it's almost like when I got older, 38, 39, it was like I started changing toward wanting to make a more conscious effort to, to be positive. Mm-hmm. And I feel there's so much negative 
and anything, not just motorcycle culture. When did you turn 39? Uh, November. Okay. I just wanted to be more positive. So like, it was almost like, like you know, I call it like the Aaron Rodgers on ayahuasca fucking journey. Like yeah. I just, I wanted to just expand on things that, that I enjoyed. And I wanted to find people that like wanted to, I don't want to say necessarily enjoy those things too, but had something that they were passionate about in a similar vein. Yeah. Like I can't paint. I can't paint for shit. Yeah. But I love to look at art, whether that's a, a bike paint job or whether that's a picture or whatever. Um, I take a, a photograph with my phone and put a filter on it. It's about artistic as I get. But I love the photographs that like you and Josh from Mercenary take and things like that. So I just wanted to find a way, to, again, since my life's like half over, to, <laughs> to just be more positive. And, and that's really what I, I, I want to do. On the bike stuff, too. Uh, I've always been a nerd. And I've always enjoyed the history of the, of the motorcycle culture and the history of motorcycle racing and, and stuff like that. But I've also just enjoyed history in general. So, like, I want to do... I want to get on my bike. And, and I want to follow the entire um, Lewis and Clark Trail. Mm -hmm. Or I want to go and, like... for so, I've been taking screenshots. For some reason, like, if you think it, it, like, shows up on your on your Facebook algorithm. Mm -hmm. but like, do you notice they add you to, like, all these weird groups now that like, you never asked to be a part of? Yeah. But, like, some of it I get is, like, um, like the Oregon Trail and shit like that. Yeah, so it'll, it'll yeah. like, it'll show me um, historical, like, monuments or markers from, like, the Oregon Trail. So I, like, screenshot it and, like, save it to a folder on my phone so that I can, like, think to, like, plan a route to go do this. Mm -hmm. And so, I don't know. I, I guess as I turned away from talking about a love of clubs or whatever and kind of, you know, got out of that, I just realized that I wanted to just, I didn't want to be negative. Yeah. So even if I had a negative thought about motorcycles or a negative thought about clubs, like you won't find it on my social media. Cause again, I think that that's stupid. Yeah. Social media is not a plat. I don't think anyway, it's a platform for your gripes or whatever. It's like, it should be a positive interaction. Um, and that's kind of what I want to do. Going forward, and I'd like to write. I I, I like to write. Um, I like to think I'm John Dunbar, which if nobody gets that, he's the fucking Kevin Costner's character in uh, Dances with Wolves. Yeah, like he has that whole fucking journal that he keeps and shit. And then maybe somebody, when I die, can use it as toilet paper. Because <laughs> that guy was like wiping his ass with his pages and his yeah. books at the end. Um, but that's what I think I'd like to do. Yeah, going forward, I don't know exactly what that looks like. I bought my first, uh, and I know everybody has one nowadays, but I bought my first uh, GoPro. Mm -hmm. And I was like, man, it doesn't have to necessarily just be motorcycle trips, but like I like to do like winter winter road trips, like you said, like and, and hike and, and stuff mm -hmm. like that. So I was thinking like, you know, like Dances with Wolves meets like Easy Rider or something like yeah. that. I was thinking yeah. about like the title could be like Great Places to Kill Yourself. <laughs> like that's, that's catchy. Yeah. Right? It's kind of romantic. Well, you could – all right, so you you asked a long time ago about some of the, the pictures and stuff, but, like, a picture – like, I think we've lost, like, sight of what a picture is, right? Mm -hmm. And this is something I've been realizing as I've been diving into photo books and things like that. A picture and where it's being consumed and the premise of what it's being consumed by is what takes away the value or adds value. Yeah. If you're on so and so's Instagram, who you follow for this reason, and they put a picture up of something that doesn't align with what they're about, then you don't understand why that fucking thing is there, mm -hmm. right? If if Chopsky all of a sudden started taking pictures of you know uh, stop signs and door and and trash cans in an artistic nature, what's going on, bro? <laughs> you yeah. good? Yeah. But. If you make a book or you make a blog about this trip and you only took your iPhone or your fucking Android and you shot things on that and put it in your blog, those photos are no different than my photos, Michael Lichter's, Chopsky's, anybody else because of the context of yeah. which you're doing it by. You don't have to be a photographer to, to – you don't have to proclaim to be a photographer – to take a photo of something and write a story about the, the journey you were on. Um, the YouTube thing, the problem with YouTube is that like so many people are doing it that you get so lost in trying to create the video 
that the subject matter of what you're trying to create gets lost in the video. Edit, yeah. Right. The more important point of what you're trying to do is tell a fucking story, put something out there to ask a question, to uh, to challenge an idea, yeah. to whatever. And well, if even you said a while ago, um, taking a picture and putting it on Instagram, even if it aligns with like your persona, your character, it's not the same as what a printed pic, as the emotions or or whatever that a printed picture will invoke. Yeah. And and that's why I think like, you know, those coffee table type photography books, when you you can take a picture off Instagram that you posted, print it and put it in a frame, and I think it hits different. It does. You just you can't get the same effect. And I love social media. I think social media has done a great job. I had a conversation um earlier, like I said, with the guy from fucking Australia. Okay, without social media, that conversation is not taking place. Mm-hmm. Like, hey man, how was your flight? Did you flush the toilet when you got home or whatever? You know, like that shit doesn't happen without social yeah. media. So there's a lot of great stuff to it. But like you said, a lot of stuff gets lost. And I think part of that is like you said, like the art. You're not gonna get the same emotion looking at it on your screen, like, oh yeah, that's really cool, versus if you saw it in a book, mm-hmm. in a frame. It's yeah. just different. It's I mean, dude, honestly, even if you go look at like like the blog that I've kind of done a few of, like mm-hmm. I want people to not look that at that on their phone. I want them to go to their computer if they still know how to use one or still <laughs> have one, and just see those images because they're full quality resolution. So mm-hmm. you can click on them and they're fucking big, mm-hmm. right? I just want people to consume and look for a different place to consume things that are inspiring or interesting to them than their phone. Mm-hmm. It's it's the act of putting the phone down, right? I, I watch a lot of YouTube. I watch it on my TV at home, mm-hmm. right? I watch a lot of uh, other things. I just try to stay off my phone. Like, you know, a tablet is even better to look at, like, the stuff. It's bigger, mm-hmm. right? Um, as far as, like, the, the writing and all the things that you're doing, I think it's important because, you know, our generation, you know, we're, we're similar in age, so it's our generation. And we're telling the story of our lives the same way David Mann and Tom Fugel told the story of their lives, mm-hmm. the same way that, you know, Michael Lichter and, you know, uh, Paul Yaffe or Arlen Ness told the story of their lives. So it's like we're just getting kind of jaded by things. So a lot of us are like, like I don't want to put my photo- photography on Instagram. I, I don't like I want to put it somewhere else where, you know, like people that are looking for it can find it and mm-hmm. they can use it in a different way. Right. The same thing with like your writing and the stories. And, you know, when I asked you, was like, what are you writing? It's like, I've been writing a lot. But, you know, it's kind of like it's got like you said, a vibe. It's got an Aaron Rodgers on ayahuasca <laughs> meets so and so. Area 51. Yeah. Yeah. It's like it's different, but it's. It's thought provoking, and I think that we've gotten so used to diving down social media and consuming things that way that when we see words, we just stay away from it. That's why nobody reads the fucking description or the comments, or not the comments, but the description or the whatever's going on in the story. A blog is what I like because you see maybe some photos or you see a premise of what it's about, but then you read it and then. You know, if you if you're in like if, if you like motorcycles and you read something about motorcycles, you're gonna have some level of interest for yeah. for amount of time, right? Mm-hmm. It's the same, like just man, like I hope that I'm hoping that within the next year to two years, I can get a magazine off the ground. Some you zine, think print? You think print will come back? Oh, hundred percent. Yeah, yeah. Uh, because it's kind of like, it's kinda like um, albums. Yeah, how vinyl albums are like all the rage. I think print's going to come back because the the same way I feel, I think that most people feel, but they're not digging deep enough to care about what it is. Mm-hmm. It's just like another, it's like, oh, this doesn't feel cool anymore. I got two kids, a mortgage, a job, a wife. I got too much going on in my life to do the deep dive of figuring out why social media doesn't fulfill me anymore. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? So... By being on podcasts, you you know, I'm trying to be honest. Like, I buy, I've been buying so many photo books, not even motorcycle related, mm-hmm. just because I'm also a, a fan of photography. Yeah. So that's another thing. But there are a lot of good things motorcycle related in print. Yeah. 
you know, or magazines. I've been doing all this deep dive, buying yeah. old dice magazines. You might not be into old choppers or triumphs or whatever, but man, there's just no. The way that magazines curated, it's just so fucking like interesting. Well, what I think is refreshing about certain blogs or or the idea of print again is that the only thing that you can do with it is view it through your lens. Like if I look at something on so on Instagram, I have my initial reaction. But like I said, if you look at the um, the comment section, mm-hmm. that could influence how you're seeing it. Yeah. Or it can completely deviate, depending on if it's positive or negative or whatever, from what the intent of the picture was. And now you're not really looking at it holistically mm. how you would have if it was just you. Yeah. But when you look at a magazine, like, yeah, there might be words with it or whatever with the artist or the writer trying to, trying to paint, give you a direction. But it's really up to you how you interpret it. Mm-hmm. And that's it. Like, the lens you see it... It's the only one you're going to see it. But if you want social media, you have your interpretation and 2,000 other people's interpretation. Mm-hmm. And that ruins it. It does. Because it doesn't feel like what you're viewing is, like, personal. Mm-hmm. You know, when you flip open the magazine, even though you know those copies went everywhere else in the country, there's still that aspect of, like, I'm on the shitter or I'm on, I'm on my couch or whatever. I'm viewing this. There's still, like, this seclusion of, like, the rest of the world, right? So you have some kind of piece of like finding something, you know, mm-hmm. and you know, the, the thing about it all is like it, it I hate that it, it, you, you can't sell it to people like, Hey, what do you want to do? Oh man, I want to make some books. Oh, is, is that still a thing? I'm like, well, I mean, books have been around for thousands of years. Right. <laughs> and right now they haven't been hot, but I mean, think about, think about passing the torch, right? Do you want books to die on our generation? No. Meaning, how many, like, books have been here forever, and f- all of a sudden, TikTok comes along, <laughs> and they're now, like, null and void? It makes no fucking sense. And I don't want that to happen on, on my lifetime, right? Because it, it's like that Kodachrome uh, movie quote about, everybody's like everything's digital and if the fucking lights go out it's it's gone forever yeah. right that yeah. that's a that's maybe that's us in our our you know 39 40 years old that's well, us looking at things differently until our until i guess our generation but i guess probably the generation after us that completely grew up with technology but before that even i mean you know when was the first printed book i guess in the 1800s so a couple 200 years old mm-hmm. But before that, there's always been a a I don't know what you call it, but a hard copy yeah. to read. Whether that was whether that was hieroglyphic, whether that was cave writings, whether that was a, a stone tablet, whatever. There's always been well, and, and even you know the old um, God damn it, what are they called? You know, you sc- fucking scrolls. scrolls. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. There's always Dead been sea scrolls. <laughs> you know, hiri hiri and all that shit. Like, there's always been something that was printed and recorded that could be saved. Mm-hmm. And, and, and in, in the evolution, yes, you certainly can do that with social media. But there's, what's the backup? Mm-hmm. The cloud? Yeah. I mean, is there, is there a guarantee that the cloud will never fuck well, up or go away or whatever? When this new movie, the Civil War movie, drops in a couple of weeks, like, we're probably going to go into a Civil War. <laughs> Therefore... Everybody's going to get inspired? Yeah. Like, hey, I guess... They just gave us the the, mm. the playbook of how to make yeah this the happen. blueprint is right there. But you know it 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 doesn't make sense. It I, I I don't know why I like shooting film photography. No, I get it. Like I don't want to sound like a boomer. Like oh man, social media is terrible because there's a lot of good uses for it. But I think there's a need for a balance between printed photography, printed word, and and what you can do in the cloud with with social media. I think it's coming down like that's a good point. I think it's coming down to where. Social media cannot, like, should not have ownership over all these mediums to where it's a catch-all be-all, right? Mm -hmm. There should be something that we do on social media for a certain reason. And if if we're being honest, like, social media in five years, if we're on the same trend, is not going to be a place of inspiration. It's going to be just a shopping mall. Yeah. The the malls themselves are dying. How long? Like, realistically, how long did Facebook last? Because Facebook is dead. 
Like Facebook is a shopping mall. Yeah. And and how long did it last? Ten years? I would I would give it ten years, yeah. Maybe. When when did it come out? It really well, was maybe fifteen years, I guess. Maybe yeah, well two thousand four. It really became available to the public in around two thousand seven, eight. Okay, nine. so let's say let's go with seven, two thousand seven. Yeah. And then when did it turn into a shopping mall? Twenty twenty one? Twenty twenty? I mean twenty nineteen? Like Facebook's been kind of a place for your grandma and shopping malls for. for I think a that few probably years. during the uh, the the rise of the Trump pres- presidency is what pushed a lot of like our generation off because of mm-hmm, mm-hmm. just the over over politics sure. on it, right? And that was 2016, 15. So yeah, I guess about ten years yeah. is what it took Facebook to really kind of become. I mean, not that it's 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 nothing now, but it's it's not what it was. Yeah, I mean, if they didn't have marketplace, how many people would not be on Facebook yeah. right now? And even Instagram, I think the amount of sponsored ads and like like Instagram in the beginning, like if you weren't following somebody, like you probably weren't seeing a ton of other shit in your feed, which was a great thing. Yeah. Now, like sponsorships is probably the majority of your feed. And like I don't remember even fucking saying this. Like, why is it in my feed? But yeah. I remember uh, we're used to that now, yeah, right? Yeah. When did I talk about fucking Toyota Camrys? <laughs> yeah. They even got Harry Man ass on my phone for like the last 30 days. The um the the other thing, um you just said it. Fuck, I lost a train of thought on that. Harry Man ass? No, way before that. <laughs> uh fuck. No, it's just it's it's just so crazy how it all it all kind of like has become. But I, I think that like because change is like something that that rolls out Mm -hmm. it doesn't fall out we get so used to the way things are mind you this remember when like the big changes happen on like iphones or like you remember the days when like facebook changed like from being a computer-based platform to like a phone-based platform yeah Yeah. like Like, who still logs in on the computer probably not that many people it's a better marketplace when you're on the computer. <laughs> I don't Straight doubt up. that. I don't doubt that. Like you see more, right? But but when people would change like the face of a website that you interact with all day, it was changed. Mm-hmm. And I think even though like change like uh like complacency is like I think most people want that because it's a security mm-hmm. of like understanding of what's going on because you know if if you are living in a routine every day, then you know that tomorrow, as long as I wake up, I can I know what to expect. Yeah, and that's a safe thing, mm-hmm. right? A very modern thing as well, right? But the human being is not designed. I I feel like we need some kind of like opposite like obstacles in life. You know, we need something, and if you you know like. We when you have a change on a social media platform, it like it it disturbs you. Even though it ends up once you get it used to it, a week later you're like, yeah, it's kind of better. Yeah, you know. And, I mean, like when you think about it, like like how like I think I'm sure like every generation feels this way or whatever. But with how fast things change and how easy of access to information with social media, it's like. Not, and not just our generation like, like you and I. I'm just saying like this time period of all people that, that are living through it. It's like you're really facing how to deal with change, I think, at a much rapid, much more rapid pace than ever before. Yeah. And you're trying to be a good human with it. And you're trying to, you know, blend, like you said, you know, evolution and evolving and, and, and you know, not just being a curmudgeon stuck in the old ways and things like that with with current technologies and you know your love for the old ways and all that kind of stuff like it really is it can stress you the fuck out yeah. trying to like just work through your feelings on it but i mean what the, so i had to look it up <laughs> it says the industrial revolution started in 1760 okay so Damn, i would have thought it was 18 something so 260 years ago but time on earth is fucking how old yeah so i mean for how many thousands of years things moved at such like a things changed, you know, involved obviously, but it was all to, to you on the ground, it would have seemed like a snail's pace. Yeah. And now it's almost like we're in fucking like hyperspeed and you have to figure out like how to like process it. And it's hard. So random thought here on this topic and on this idea. Um, so 
this the the nature of learning and and gathering information like say you, I, I said it in another podcast recently but basically let's say you want to be a custom painter now mm-hmm. right when i in the in the mid 2000s the odds yeah, yeah i like that there was a there was a a path in which you could take and it it was like yeah about 3 to 4 years you can get pretty proficient at custom painting Depending on how much time, yeah, Malcolm Gladwell outliers, like how much time you can put into this this craft, right? Because also the available information out there was very limited. Mm-hmm. Like the amount of learning and information you can gather can exponentially help you grow the craft that you're doing faster. So I think that in some aspects, some of our generation or some of what's going on now is that we're being crammed down with so much information. So we're able to go from being a pick, buying a camera, not knowing the the triangle of like shutter speed, aperture, ISO to like a week later, we were, you know, a week later of like trying something like that. You can be where someone in the 90s might have taken them three months Mm -hmm. because of how much information and whether you choose to use it or not, right? Did you watch that Tom Hanks movie, News of the World or whatever? Uh, no, I haven't. But it took, like, the Pony Express, mm-hmm. like, 10 days or whatever, like, get cross-country yeah. with news. 10 days. So, you, so like, you could be in the South, and all of a sudden you got to free your slaves, and you don't know about it for 10 days. You're 10 days behind the power curve. That's a terrible analogy, and yeah. people are going to be upset about yeah. that. But, <laughs> but I'm just, like, now we have instant access to information. Well, that's the concept of uh, Juneteenth, so, right? <laughs> So like, but now you can find out that you know you hate Trump or you hate Biden instantaneously. Like yeah. you can know somebody can tell you that you hate those folks as soon as you pick up your phone. Mm. But in order to even understand that you didn't like Abraham Lincoln, it was going to take you ten days to get that information. Like it's, just, it's and then crazy. Ten more days to get the rebuttal information, <laughs> and then ten days to get this person's version of it. But and again, it, it seems like to us, oh man, you know the Pony Express. I guess what eighteen hundreds, right? Yeah. Oh man, 1800s, that was 220 some years ago. Okay, but how old is the earth? Like, how long has man been on earth? And like, yeah. Pony Express was like wild innovation and technology for that time. So, yeah, I think it's, it's crazy nowadays, like how fast things are coming at you, and you have to be able to adapt and process it without being overwhelmed. That's the problem. It's like the overwhelming for a lot of people becomes anxiety. It becomes mm-hmm. like, uh, it becomes like trying to keep up with the Joneses. It becomes like yeah. hustle culture. Gary V, you gotta fucking do this. Yeah, you gotta it's work like, twenty five hour days. It's like, dude, there, there's, there, you know, a Gary V listening to him or Andy Frisella, like that shit's like listening to fucking rock music, or you know, kickstart my heart and lifting weights. Yeah. Dude. Like there's certain things that just go hand in hand, but it's not necessarily like the way to be all the time. Yeah, right. You're able to get so much information so quick. So a lot of people choose to do so. Or they choose not to do so, right? Mm-hmm. But the thing is, I think that because we can do so quick, we can re- we reach those like plateaus or that we reach those roadblocks way quicker in um, in hobbies and, and things. And so people have a hard time finding something that really truly resonates with them because what might have took in a year and a half of investment. Remember we said earlier on the car, like, when you earn something, yeah. when you, it takes time to save up to get that speed dealer swing arm versus affirming it, like you appreciate that purchase and the fact that now you now own it versus yeah. like if you don't have the money but you were able to fucking put it on a credit card, like maybe you will have the same feeling. I'm just generalizing, but realistically, like you, you're gonna have a different relationship with everything, you know and. I think that's where we're getting to is that like the relationship with everything we do in our life is getting so uh, just so fast forwarded that the enjoyment of what we just spent our money and our hard earned work and time on is not being able to be lived out. Yeah. Like you spend this money on buying a new house and how long before it's like, you know, like the, the you, now you're worried about the economy, or now now it's like, uh, are we in another recession? Like all these other things, like all these big purchases, these big things you should be super proud of. Like there's all these other caveats. Oh fuck! I now I got an HOA. You know, but, what I mean? and again, I think that that's something. And, and <coughs> you know, 
uh, is hopefully a, 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 who cares what we have to say maybe but but a podcast you know people everybody's got a podcast nowadays and all that stuff all right good like I think there needs to be a normal a normalization in the conversation that it's okay to like have these thoughts because I think a lot of people have like goddamn information comes at me so fucking fast it gives me anxiety sometimes it's okay to say that like it's okay to like yeah that's fucking true. understand that's where the anxiety yeah. is probably coming from yeah I mean because you're living through wild ass times like it's okay you're living through the next industrial revolution with AI and everything else yeah. and you don't have to be a fucking boomer and you don't have to be fucking a tinfoil hat like it's okay to like feel back and forth and on, on, like how do you adapt with it with also 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 appreciating you know the old ways or you like say you know appreciating social media but also appreciating the art in, in, in a print photo let me ask like you this that. do you have an opinion and I've done a, a semi deep dive on hipster culture have you ever dived into any of that no, no because it, it's fun to make fun of hipster culture it, it's a it's a clickbait word like yeah. millennial or yeah. whatever but know. I don't I've never I'm not I, they seem like they have good fashion and I don't so I, like, yeah. you know I don't understand it enough well, I, I did watch a whole documentary on YouTube. There's a YouTube. whole fucking documentary There's on it? lots of information about it. And there okay. was, like, movements. There was a musical. There was a lot of things, like, certain parts of the country that kind of helped, like, move it going. And, man, I, I, I brought it up hoping that you actually did it, too. But, like, because no, I, I forgot. Culture. No, it, It's I, interesting. As far as, like, you know, like. like because it's, 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 like, at this point, it's about 20 years old is when it, maybe 25 years old. Is when it really starts to kind of like become something. Yeah. Remember, I was telling you in the car that like somebody somebody does something, and then it takes five to maybe ten years, depending on how fast information travels, to become kind of a mainstream thing. Yeah. And then by the time it does, the people that created it are already on to three other things. Yeah. Now right? the chopper dudes. Yeah. But <laughs> the culture behind it, I, I think, because the word is associated with like. A, almost at a negativity thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That, There's no good connotation with hipster. Yeah, when you see the the hipster is like, it's gentrification, it's all these other it's things. It's Paps Blue River, yeah. Yeah, but it's like also like, okay, well, what came out of that that move? Uh, those shitty parts of the country that I used to never be able to go hang out in now have pretty cool fucking art scenes, you know? And as an art fan, like, I like art scenes. Well, and you know what? I guess probably it's a controversial now or whatever but i don't agree that a hipster movement and i don't think gentrification should be tied to a hipster movement okay. and i do i do feel bad i don't feel bad is the right word but I, I i'm aware that gentrification doesn't benefit all yes because it prices people out of what used to be affordable housing Agreed. and puts them into a position where they have to move into communities where they don't have roots where they don't have identity where it's not, you know, their neighbors may not be who their neighbors were for decades or centuries yeah. or, or whatever. It takes away the community aspect of it when you gentrify a neighborhood. But you can also do great things with gentrify. I get it. No, I'm 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 with you on that. But hundred percent. But when I look at a truly gentrified neighborhood, was it a hipster or was I mean is it's a hard one, but like, are hipsters liberals? Like, are all hipsters liberals? Because I feel like the uber liber liberal movement, and I, I don't know, I feel like I'm a bit of a liberal, I don't know, whatever that middle of the road, what do they call that middle of the road uh, thing? Libertarian. You know, or no, what's the middle of the road? Yeah, that, but there's like a term for middle of the road. But whatever it is, whatever. I think like the uber moderate? liberal, there you go, really led the charge in gentrification. Mm. I don't I don't know our hips did, did they, maybe I don't know enough about because I don't watch documentaries on I it. I kinda now that I've brought it up very confidently, I kinda want to go back and watch it again on YouTube <laughs> just to like remember like what I learned. No, I'm gonna have to go back and watch it back. Who the fuck's responsible for this? No. Well I I think gentrification is taking place forever because yeah, yeah. when you when cities get, you know when when certain areas grow and they price lots of people out of being able to do anything there they find other areas to exploit for the most part and it's just like it's a part of capitalism it's a yeah. part of like you know growth and it's like it, when you get to a point in your life you know 
You can blame it on a generate. You can blame it on the boomers and say that they bought all the shit and now they have so much then it's not available to a gen, you know, Gen X. Well, who killed? Who killed the cities? And this is a weird, probably a weird rabbit hole for, for the podcast. But who killed the cities, in the first place? Like, I mean. You know, when you think about giant cities like I'm sure you know Dallas, but we'll, Detroit, we'll use Milwaukee for example, okay. just because we're you know we're here. But like Milwaukee was a shipping, industrial, steel, the Great Lakes, like send it down the river, all that kind of stuff, and and the culture that was here, the 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 Germans and the and the fucking Polish and and all of these kind of people that were here, they all had these houses that were right downtown, so they were super close to um to the water right yeah. to the shipping industries and to these factories that built stuff to support so they really need to have a industry. car it was close yeah. enough to like yeah, yeah, walk yeah. or whatever yeah. and then because of these you know they called I mean, there's a thing you can look it up like the great migration so now all of a sudden from the south all of these 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 free blacks came and and they wanted these good jobs in the north i get mm-hmm. it Right. So now they're taking part. Now, all of a sudden, you know, you fast forward how many every years and the shipping is dying. The the in the warehouses, the the factories that are supporting the shipping industry are dying and nobody's taking care of them. Nobody in these communities is figuring out how to repurpose them for fucking decades. They just sit decaying and vacant and everything else. And everybody moves on. And it's not a race thing. Like Everybody moves on. that can afford to move on. Everybody that can afford to move on go somewhere else. And so now these 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 cities are where the low income housing is and where the the non opportunities have become. And then somebody comes through and wants to gentrify it. So I mean like, you know, like I guess like it's to me it's a deeper question that I don't have answers to, but like all of this microcosm of stuff that's happening, like what really led to the decline was it the just the labor market and the industry and these jobs going away. Well, I think it's the, I think it's the biggest thing, and and once again, two idiots talking about shit that we're not fucking very. <laughs> That's the name of the about. podcast right there. The the title. Two idiots. Two idiots. <laughs> um, you know, in a very in a motorcycle goggles, uh, yeah. you know, view of this thing, um, it's it it's an opportunity. Like if I think that like when it, when you see these old factories getting repurposed into uh, lofts, mm-hmm. right. I used to, that was my jam. I wanted to have a loft when I was. Oh, I think they're super dope. And I had some, and I got to live in some of these things. And it was sketchy as fuck downstairs walking in my apartment. When you got in there, I was like, hell yeah. yeah. You know, but these areas, they grow. and But a lot of them, they grow and they enforce art. Because even as they start to gentrify, it's still cheaper for everybody to be a part of it. Right? You get these art cultures and movements that come into these areas. And all of a sudden... There's a place for for photography. There's a place for you know, um, graffiti or murals or fucking paintings or glass blowers or all this other shit. And you know, there, there's a bunch of people in the world that like, you know, jerk off motion, all that stuff. They don't care about art, and that's fine. Yeah. Right. That's fine. That's a choice. I don't care about Traeger grills. I don't give a fuck about Not smoking no meats. No, I fucking go to <laughs> Texas Roadhouse or something like that. You know, like there's. We all have our shit that we're into. Are they from into. Texas? Texas, probably not. They're probably from like Pennsylvania. Probably from Chicago. Yeah, but it's like when you get out of Texas, the steaks get better um, from Texas Roadhouse. But the the point is like, man, like we this human experience, uh, this human experiment, if you will, at the at the the in the industrial revolution, there is nothing that's hundreds of years old. This is all like we're figuring it out. So. Everybody that thinks that, like, you can, you know, the way, like, the motorcycle industry, the way it's been is not the way it's always going to be. You have to understand that things are going to change. And the people that try to make it stay the same are usually the people that are older, and they had a good run of 15, 20, maybe 30 years of it being good and profitable for them. And then they don't want to fucking, like, listen to anybody else. They don't want to see the changes. They want to keep it this. And then they fucking decline and go away. Or... They have a lot of market share, and they make it hard for anything to come up, right? There's so many things going on where it's like, you know, people are saying, like, we need term limits for fucking, you know, the politicians, but we we kind of need term limits for fucking boomers, right? Yeah. They need to get out of fucking power in some areas and let other people in. They should have 
let a lot of they should have started bringing a lot of people in a long time ago because you have like you have a whole generation skipped you have the whole generation x that's like still working for their parents who still run companies but their son of the gen x son is probably going to be the hair the 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 heirloom or get, no the, I, I feel like at this point the gen x is probably the one in charge eh no when's gen x uh gen x is like the 60s and 70s yeah, that motherfucker's got to be old as shit. Because mm-hmm. you're a millennial. I'm a millennial. I'm, I'm like Because we're, we're like the tail end. Of, we're, or not the tail end, beginning. but we're like the very beginning of millennials. So the Gen X, a lot of the bigger companies. So the, the, Is Fred Durst a Gen Xer? Probably. Because he did the Generation X. But, yeah, that's actually a good point. That's <laughs> <laughs> how I remember it. I was like, what did Fred Durst say about that but, fucking bridge? But so, so Boomer or Gen X is going to be like... 43 like if they're like 43 44 years old to like 60 okay so a lot of 70s and 80 year old people still run companies right those people are boomers and that's kind of like that that's our presidents are boomers right? no, yeah. and, and i get that argument like i mean not and it's not like i'm a, a pr- i think because i'm a motorcycle guy from the midwest uh, like and a farm kid like i gotta be like pro donald trump like no like He's old as shit too, but like right now, who's currently in charge is Joe Biden. That motherfucker. I mean, his own, the own, his doctor. I, I guess I don't pay enough attention to current events, but somebody that he had that medical evaluation. Yeah. Like this motherfucker, is senile. <laughs> like, and but, he's got the codes to the nuke, and he's fucking senile. Like the biggest question about it all, and sorry we're going super political, but like regardless of where you stand on it, the fact that we get these, we get drama. Information with no solution. Mm-hmm. There was, I think that's got a lot to do with how fucking uh, like wired we are as a society because we have news telling us that this is going on and this is going on, but we never see how those problems got solved or how they got talked about, right? If Biden has a fucking like he's senile or whatever the fuck, all right. What what what's going on? Yeah. What's happening? Well, and I think too, and maybe it, I, you tie this into motorcycle clubs, is the scream the screaming down culture like the scream you down. It's it's the refusal to have a conversation at all if it's not something. That, it's the echo chamber. Like if yeah. it doesn't align with your views, you're not going to have that conversation at all. And if you want to tie it back to motorcycles or, or club culture or whatever, I think you see some of the same shit in club culture where if it's not your flag, if it's not your club, you're not going to listen to any conversation outside of that. Yeah. And that's not healthy. Like That's not good for anything. And I think we see the same thing now. I would love to sit down with somebody that thinks differently than me mm. and have a normal conversation. Because I think I, I do. I think I try not to, but I think I live very much inside of an echo chamber because most of my friends probably have similar views or opinions to I do or that I do. But, you know, we're talking about, you know, what, who's the response or what are some um, influences, some causes uh, that lead to gentrification, right? Going back to to the change in, in industries and things like that. Well, there's somebody that could talk very, you know, you know, has, has probably has a great education and viewpoint on, racism and, and real estate and the housing market and pricing people out and, and, and illegal pra- or um, these unfair practices and things like that that would be fascinating to learn that I have no idea about that would give a better picture to um, gentrification, why yeah. it's good or why it's bad, et cetera. But it's like we people just don't want to have that conversation. Or they don't want to look and find out any answers for yeah. themselves. You and, know? and then people that would have that conversation, like they're not finding each other. Like just, it's not happening because it's going to... Turn into a shit show, and I think the same thing happens with with clubs, where people that are fighting in the club world because they they feel like they can't have a conversation. Mm. Yeah, they're they're bred to hate, you know. Yeah, I think it's, and I think it's another one of those things where it's not the majority; it's the loud minority. Yeah, yeah, that's completely fair. I mean, everything's on, you know. If you really think about social media, you know what really prepped social media to be like the influencer, the brand ambassador, the everything that like social social media in the two thousands looked way different than it does in the in yeah. the twenty tens, right? Reality TV. Do you think if reality reality TV didn't exist, that we would have the kind of people 
that people are aspiring to be through social media. Yeah. You know what I mean? If it went like Friends, Seinfeld, you know, uh, goddamn Sopranos, and all of a sudden Instagram influencers. Yeah. Yeah. And and that's it. Like reality TV took, and I'm not saying they have no talent, but it took people that, in theory, especially in the early days of reality TV, were like General Joes. Yeah. And made them fucking famous and popular and gave yep. them access to all that shit. Look, getting your dick sucked is fucking fun. And if you're virtually or metaphorically sucking someone's dick for no other skill other than that they were on TV and you liked what they did on TV, that feels good. And they're going to keep fucking doing that. And other people are going to want to get their dick sucked in the same way. Yeah. A good example of that, and maybe not for the person that might is probably going to hear this because of how this story is about to uh, arc right quick. We're talking about you, Mark. Um, so, uh, like I was telling you, I was having lots of, like, I don't know if I would call it interviews or b- I was talking with a lot of brands at Mama Tried yeah. on business stuff, right? They were all sucking your dick. No. <laughs> but as I'm sitting there, and a lot of times these are brands that have a lot going on, so I have to sit there and just kind of, like, wait till they can talk to me. The best part is when we're all having a real, this happened one time. We're all having this big conversation. I'm selling myself. They're, try, they're trying to like decide whether or not I'm valuable or whatever the fuck, whatever the metric is, right? This dude walks up, completely interjects into the conversation, like kind of rude, to be honest with you, and says, bro, can I get a picture? I love your podcast as I'm trying to sell the podcast. It could easily look like I paid this dude to do it. Yeah. So I take this picture in front of these other guys who consider themselves to be more known. Did you ask him to get the fuck out of the picture? Hey, guys, can you get out of the picture? (laughs) No, I just... It was just... I couldn't have painted a better picture to kind of help sell the situation. But, um, you know, the goal with this whole Mama Tried thing was to really try to make myself... Like, I don't like... I like intimate, real conversations. So the... The surface level stuff sometimes is difficult, but I understand why it's important to have them, and mm-hmm. I'm trying to be more mindful of that. You know what yeah. I mean? And I agree. With you. I like reels, and yeah. I like all that cool shit. And I want to see titties with stickers on them of girls that I can't get anymore, and fucking burnouts and all that good shit. But I think that there is a place and a market for more substance. Yeah, I'm not knocking those things. But do they really have substance? Do they have staying like your, power? Your wild ass video about how fucking how many fucking shots you can do or how fast you could ride. Cool. Is there really is there really anything? Is there more to that though? Like, like there's a um, it's a quote I was like it's, it's about girls, but I think it applies to to motorcycles too. Is like you showed your ass. Now let's see your heart. Like, mm-hmm. I love that shit. Like all right, dude, cool, great wheelie, love it. Yeah, what, what do you, you got? about? What yeah. else you got? Like, I can't do it, Willie. So I love it. Like, like, good job. But, like... How can I identify with you? Like, yeah. how, how can you provide any, some more value yeah. to my life? You know, maybe it's through your perspective of why you do what you do or what how you think. And, you know, as, as we all, like, it could be a fucking deep, you know, conspiracy theory that this is the government's way of taking the most ultimate power of having social media connectivity uh, community and making us all hate each other because of what we highlight as good shit. Well, yeah, you saw the social the, uh, that social, social dilemma, dilemma yeah. yeah. And I mean, to, to yeah, I think social media is absolutely a weapon. If you yeah. want it to be, social media is a weapon. I don't want it to be. Like, I like social media, but I think it's got great purposes. But if you don't, if you want to use it as a weapon, you totally can use it as a weapon. You know what? The only thing that I've ever had gone viral is things that are polarizing or they are uh maybe not polarizing it's a uh, when you have opposition going yeah yeah polar. Polar- okay so or divisive or divisive polar- yeah. yeah divisive is probably a better word so it's like basically you need two uh, opposing opinions to see the video and fight in the comments and that makes you get a three something million or ultimate positivity that just like ocean spray dude fucking you know with with Fleetwood Mac. Like, you know what I've been watching lately? Hmm. Um, I don't care what anybody thinks about this. Love on the Spectrum. 
Oh, yeah. Dude, that shit is so wholesome. You're such a fucking, uh, what's the name fan? Uh, dude, Shane Gillis. Dude, I got on fucking Ted Lasso. Have you watched Ted Lasso? All right. Ted Lasso is hands down one of the shows that I fucking love so much yeah. because I feel good after it. That's how I feel in love on the spectrum and That's Ted Lasso. Because every time you think something bad is going to happen in Ted Lasso, like the opposite happens. One of the best episodes on Ted Lasso is when they started playing. They all started singing uh, uh, Hey Jude. Mm -hmm. oh, bro, tears. <laughs> but do you remember when, I think it was like the first episode or the second episode, when he he went to that that girl What's that was dating one of his players or whatever. That girl that became like a figure. I forget what her oh, name was. Oh, yeah. Show, but she became like a central figure in the, yeah. in the show. And the, the the reporter, whatever, the tabloid, like took the picture to try and make it look like, oh, fuck, Ted's fucked. Oh, this is going to go bad. And then it like turned out positive. Mm. Like, oh man, I love this show. It really is a great show. And dude. that's how I watch um, uh, Down for Love, which people like give it a hard time because it's Downs for Love, like Down Syndrome. It's a great fucking show. It makes you feel good. Yeah. Yeah, but I mean, I, I guess I could see on. I feel like I'm being a woke fucking purple haired fuck right now. But you can be. You can like positive. Like not everything. Yeah, has to be I negative. guess it's positive, but I think it's like. The ex exploitation of like Down syndrome as a whole, like for entertainment. I can see know? that. I can definitely see that. But like you hear some of their stories, like in their own words, but like like maybe more more so love on the on the spectrum. Mm -hmm. Like where these kids were just like bullied, like just terrible. Like their lives fucking sucked. Yeah. And whether or not they're being exploited and the parents should let them be on TV, I get that argument. But, like, to watch them, like, do the one thing that they never thought they were, like, dating and, like, have a partner and all that shit. Yeah. Uh, like, I, fuck, I can see that's that so angle. wholesome. And, like, every, like, dude or guy or girl they go out with, like, the very first, like, I love this girl. <laughs> like, they're always like, like, damn, dude, I want to be, I want to feel that. Like, the very first girl they ever meet, like, I love this bitch. <laughs> like, three minutes into it, like, I fucking love her. That's, yeah, I could see that being, like, very, you know. We're, we're, I think we're all looking for positivity right now. And, um, well, are you like, like, you know, it, say what you want about reality shows, right? But all these other like fucking dating shows, where everybody's trying to like just manipulate and fuck or, or they're never like real. Like, like, they find like the 10 fucking hottest people in Dallas, and that's what they're going to put on this fucking reality dating show or whatever. Like, my wife uh, used to cut hair for one of the dudes that was on the show. It was weird. But, and then like, again, not that, that, there's not beauty in down syndrome, but whatever, right? Like, like fucking, it's different, and it's like feels more real. Yeah, well, and that's the whole point, like more real. Yeah, the real. That's a hundred percent. Like, social media has trained us to like, like, not be as real as possible. Like, like I don't, I don't want to put my negativity in my life out there because it becomes like Facebook drama. Mm -hmm, oh. Mm -hmm. Kathy's got another baby daddy, yeah. you know, like none of that type of shit. It's like I, my problems are for me to deal with. It's not for the world to fucking have to burden as well, right? I want to put positivity out there, mm -hmm. but positivity looks like, uh, it looks like uh, boasting, bragging, uh, you know, look at me, I got this. You'll never get this, you know. <laughs> you'll never get, and then she Whatever. got this. Yeah. So it's like, it's not that. It's, you know, it's, through the vein of like, if you listen to the podcast and you see the posts that I put on social media, then you might have a different angle of looking at it because you probably hear more of my struggles to get to that than mm -hmm. people that only follow me on social media. They might see that as, oh, looks like Jace has all this money. He's in New York on a CVO, like blah, blah, blah. And, you know, but I also don't want to go take pictures of my house and be like, this is what my life is really like. And yeah, but your house, there's nothing wrong with your house. But that's yeah. the thing. It's like, it's 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 all uh, perspective, right? My house is not, I I talk it up on the podcast like it's a piece of shit. Like, I'm, it's going to be the death of me. But it's, it's not. It's fucking a brick home, four fucking, you know, three rooms, one bathroom. And you put work into it. And you might, I'm assuming, you will put more work when you want to. One day, maybe. <laughs> but the, the point is, is like, is I think that like the perspective is a lot of people are thinking, oh, like you have 
I live in that house and I stay, I live as cheap as possible to well, be able to do the again, things that again, I want to yeah. do. Not know? putting your business on Front Street, but your payment for that house, your mortgage is low as fuck for 2024. Yeah. And it's not a bad house. It's not Section 8 housing. So is it the biggest house in the world? No. Yeah. But again, you have one of the lowest fucking mortgages that could probably exist <laughs> for that many bedrooms in 2024. Yeah. And that fits what you want to do with your life. Okay. Uh, if people are mad that you can go to New York and write a CVO, well, they should have structured their life so that they could do that. Yeah. There's people that might live in, I mean, nobody lives in a better house than I do, but, <laughs> but yeah, nice look at Craig, look at Craig. We'll pick on, on Craig for a minute. Um, Craig's flying to Key West or some shit right now. Like you could hate on him for that, but you know if you know Craig, like he doesn't even own a house. Yeah, he just drives it's truck and has like a, a shop, and some, some yeah. crackheads in it. Like yeah. you know, like he structured his life so that he could do those things that bring him. There's pleasure. there's so many other angles to have. Like the American dream is 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 not one uh, size fits all, no. right? There's so many ways you can have it. And honestly, as a, as a kid that like grew up thinking that I had to get married, have kids, and I need a fucking job to do this, like, bro, like we we came off the generation of pensions, and like you get one job in a factory doing roofs or something like that, making shingles. I remember I almost took a job making shingles. And it was one of those things where the guy that was trying to get me to do it when I was like 20 years old was making stupid money. And then the dude, like, it went away. And he was, like, coming to do, like, entry-level stuff because his job required no skill, mm -hmm. no transferable skill, mm -hmm. right? It was a skill in that field that got uh, automated, yeah. right? Yeah. There's so many that, that happened in our generation because – as an early millennial, like you go to, you graduate from high school and essentially right in the dot com boom or the, uh, you know, the social media boom. And, you know, when we look at technology of like 2003 and four and five and six, it was mind blowing to 1996. Yeah. But to now, it's so radically different. And that's why I said it rolls out, it doesn't. Flop but out, right? again, I mean, to people that that would look at your social media and have a fucking opinion on what you get to do, though, like, fine, then structure your life that way. Yeah. And and maybe it's unfortunate if somebody's fucking forty years old, they can't go back and start learning how to sand cars or whatever with their dad. But you know, you made your choices to take your life in a direction that you thought you wanted to. Yeah. Um, and well, I tell people all the time, like, look, I envy you way more than you envy me, like. If like your life, like you have a beautiful home, yeah. you got a beautiful wife, and you have a and family, I, and look at—I almost pissed all that shit away. Mm. Like, I mean, so you know, you again, you're in control of of your own decisions, and there's yeah. no point in being fucking. You can appreciate what somebody else has and think, oh, well, how do I get there? Yeah. But not to be jealous, not to be envious. Like, that's well, fucking, to be inspired. Yeah, it's fucking stupid to be jealous, but. Jealousy is like kind of like I want that you don't want you don't deserve that. Yeah, it's kind of like a. a I agree. I love that analogy. Like, I think it's, it it almost has an air of like I'm better than you. So why I don't have I it. have that? Yeah. Why why do you have that when I'm better than you? Yeah, I mean, that's kind of what jealousy portrays. I, I never. Why really, can't everybody win? I, I never really understood the 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 vernacular between jealousy and envy, like. I know they're the same, but there's like a there's got to be a nuance that makes one different than the other, you know? Yeah, I mean, I'm sure there is. <laughs> Did you know the eighth deadly sin and the worst, apparently, in biblical terms, is the sin against the Holy Ghost? And if you ask yourself, what is that? It's making one a son of perdition. To sin against the Holy Ghost means you deny who you are and why you exist. You know how much ayahuasca you need to fucking make that make sense? Yeah, that's not gonna. They that might have been that'll drive you up a wall to deny who you are and why you exist. To deny who you are, but to discover who you are is the whole goal. That's the that's the that's the meaning of life, right? Yeah. And that's like a that's a lifelong discovery. Very few humans are capable 
of sinning against the Holy Ghost, the eighth deadly sin, because very few people truly know who we are and why we exist. But as one truly knows, and it is one who truly knows, and yet rebels against their very essence, who has committed the ultimate sin, which is denying their very existence. So it's like, it sounds like a, a form of control. Like ah, you gotta be high as fuck to make that make sense. Well, it sounds like a church, like the church added that. Like, well, hey, aren't, look, aren't all the seven deadlies a Catholic church thing? Yeah. So think about like what you just said. Hey, if you figure out who you are. You better not tell everybody because you're gonna fucking <laughs> yeah. you're, you're gonna yeah. show the man yeah. behind the curtain here, yeah. you know. Um, yeah, the whole thing is like it's that's supposed to be the thing. It's like life is I think the best carrot on the end of the stick kind of situation is that like to find out who you are is the is the human experience of growing. Like not knowing ever is the reason why you look for it. It's the growth, the pattern, the chase. Yeah. And uh, if I mean, if you're 20 years old and you know that you you're, the universe reveals the secrets to you, like why continue? Like, you know what I mean? Like, if that all it just goes out the window. So it's like, and we all take different paths, right? Like some people, you know, motorcycling is weird, man. It really is. Like if you really <laughs> just peel back the the layer, like. There's got to be some kind of study or some kind of situation that why do we choose that over any other thing? No. You know, why why is it that motorcycles over, you know, a softball team? Yeah. Over- I think it, I think it's it's a com- it's a thing that combines so many different senses, whether it's excitement, adrenaline, art, beauty, scenery like you know these these sceneries the, these things that you're seeing these places that you're going and and the and the 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 visions that it invokes in you the beauty in that and stuff like that i think motorcycling is something that gives you a variety of things like in softball they're probably the only thing you're really drawing on right just competition and, and maybe like drive to get better i'm thinking of a very romantic softball scenario can i yeah can I how hot is she yeah. no 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 it's, it's not her it's a bunch of fat dudes so <laughs> No, I've played softball in leagues before Mm -hmm. at one point in time, way before I got really heavy and deep into this shit. But, you know, there's this 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 camaraderie, this community aspect to it that comes comes to play. And, you know, it's usually at night. There's a there's a sunset. There's the lights. There's your people, your old lady, maybe your kids watching you, your friends and you're having fun and you're challenged. But you're also like. It's not the end of the world if, like, it doesn't go perfectly, right? Mm-hmm. There's just a lot of things to that where I understand where that can suffice or that can fulfill maybe a void in somebody, someone's life but still have the family involved. Motorcycling is kind of selfish, yeah, right? It's, it's selfish in the fact that, like, you know, you're literally – you can share it with your wife, but she has no control. Yeah. Or your wife can share it with you and you have no control. It's but like – to, to your point too, I think you know, kind of like we talked about with clubs too earlier. Um, if done correctly, it can help you grow. Yes, and that will make you better in your family, make you better dad, better husband, whatever. So again, it's not what can you do. Yes, give back, but what can it do to help you grow? And that I think will make you a better person. Yeah, I think. Well, just the. Being alone with yourself in a helmet or just with the wind passing your ears, it's like you, you know, the, the you just start peeling back the layer of the onion, you know what I mean? Finding, you know, asking yourself questions, figuring out, like, do you really feel confident about this next decision in your life? Do you want to do this? Do you want to do that? But you don't get that on the ride to the bar, you know? Yeah. You don't. I mean, you get a ride home after you're drunk. Exactly. <laughs> you usually get DWIs. Yeah. But it's not to say that, like, riding to the bar to have some drinks with your friends is, like, frowned upon. Like, no. Like, that's part of motorcycling, too. Yeah. It's yeah. all it's all part of it. Like, this, the human, the, the rider experience is all that. Yeah, it's, and no part of it is wrong until, I think, my, my opinion, until you pigeonhole yourself into one thing. Until you're only about getting influencers, um, followers to be an influencer. Yeah. Until you're only about going to the bar on your bike. Until you're only, you know, oh, I'm a long-distance rider, but the only time you're doing it is to an event. I think once you become just about one thing, 
then it's a problem. Then it's yeah. toxic to the community. But again, all I think, like you said, just like you said, all those things combined, I think are, are great and yeah. make people better to hang out with the homies, to ride long distance, to share ideas on social media. That's the good shit. That's a good point. Yeah, that's exactly it. It's like if I, if I only drive to bike night because I won't allow myself to hop on my bike unless I'm doing 2,000 miles, you're a pretentious fuck, dude. <laughs> let's, let's be real. Yeah. But, you know, like there's times where on a Sunday, perfect weather, I want to bar hop today. Yeah. I want to go, maybe not even drink, but I want to go hang out with the homies and bop and, here to here to here and to here. And you know what? It's, it's okay, too, to skip a day. You yeah. don't need to ride every day. Like, if you want to sit home and play Red Red Dead Redemption 2, yeah. I'm not hating on you. I'll fuck with that. <laughs> and I think that's it. Like, so many people get caught up in, like, well, what's so-and-so doing? Well, I got to do that, too. Like, yeah. It's, only it's putting, a tough one. They right? might have fucking, they might have went on that ride that you're seeing a week ago. Mm. If you sit at home and play Call of Duty, it's fine. It goes back to what I've been saying a lot, and I like saying it on the podcast so people, it gets hammered down their throat. Be content with what you're doing no. and stop worrying about what other people are doing. You know? Be more positive. Like If we're going to end on something, like mm-hmm. be more positive. The world's got enough badasses and enough light. You know, The world's got enough lightning bolts. <laughs> be positive. Yeah. Be the peaceful rain. <laughs> Do the ayahuasca. Ambiance. Yeah. Do ayahuasca. Yeah, well, do, Dave, I appreciate it, man. Like, thank you for the hotel room, for sure. I, I was much rather be at your house, like, uh, listening to your door and masturbating. You going to cut this part out? <laughs> no, I'm leaving it in. <laughs> Just to make it awkward. Yeah, people are like, why didn't you let him stay at his fucking house? Okay, I double booked the house. I didn't know that we had somebody else staying with us. Yeah. But. Well, I appreciate you. I wasn't going to put you in the street, like, or in bed with him. <laughs> well, hey. He's a nice guy. I mean, you guys would get along fine, but it's a small. You've been. How do you know you're gay? <laughs> you've been down there. It's a smaller. You've been down there. It's a smaller bed. I like that room. It's cool. We haven't changed it since the last time you and your wife were down there doing whatever. Yeah, I remember you gave me that spotted cow while I was here that time. Did you? We drank it on the podcast. We did. Yeah, I saved, saved it, right? It, yeah. I did have another spotted cow on this trip, and it tasted like y'all's version of PBR. <laughs> Even though PBR's from here too. All right, let's end this. All right. <laughs> Bye. I hope you guys enjoyed this episode with Dave, and I want to say thanks to Dave for all his support of the podcast over the years. I've truly enjoyed our friendship. The Fast Life Camp Out 7 is almost here, May 2nd through the 5th, Moyers, Oklahoma. You don't want to miss this one. Grassroots-style camping, riding, and good old-fashioned good times. Hope to see you guys out there. Just remember, you just got to show up, pay camping fees, throw a tent up wherever you want, and have a good time. So far, we've dropped 10 episodes of our Garage Talk podcast on Patreon. The new series is more dedicated at current things in and around the motorcycle world with a lot of familiar podcast guests you know and love. And it's just another way we're trying to build the community on our Patreon. So check out the links down below in the description. And don't forget to check out our sponsors. A lot of great opportunities for you to get cool stuff for you and your bike. And yeah, you'll be supporting this podcast by doing so. I hope you guys have a good kickoff to april a lot of cool things going on in the motorcycle world and i hope you're getting out there and riding two wheels and making some good memories for yourself so we'll catch you guys on the next episode you guys stay safe out there